Yes. Lindsay? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Amy? Yes. And myself, that's a yes as well. So that's unanimous. Again, thank you, um, Lindsay, for putting those minutes together for us. We appreciate it. I don't see any hands up in the Zoom chat. Um, so if, if anybody's having a problem with that, feel free to just speak up now to let me know. Okay. So um, hearing none, we'll move on. Uh, the next item on the agenda, item number eight, are the presentations um, which is the request for additional support documentation. Oh, was somebody saying something or was that my own feedback? Okay. All right, I thought I heard something, but maybe not. All right, so um, Steve, uh, city manager, I will turn the time over to you. Okay. So in, in your packet, um, Ronnie has put in both the revenue and the expense reports uh, for your review. And I've asked Ronnie to just give you a quick update as far as where the city stands year to date uh, as, those, uh, as those financials has, have been presented. So Ronnie. Thank you, Steve. <clears throat> the year to date budget reports that I included in your packet this week were run as of March 18th. Um, it includes not only the 2022 actuals as of March 18th, it also includes the 2021 actuals as of June 30, 2021. Um, the expense report provided in your packet is an update for the first 38 weeks of the fiscal year, which is July 1st of 2021 through March 18th. With 30 week, 38 weeks into the fiscal year, departments should be at or near 73% expended. Departments are currently at 72.3% expended or just 0.7% under budget. Wages and employment con contractual items year to date are at 72.1% expended with full-time wages at only 66%. Although full-time wages are at 66%, <clears throat> overtime for all departments is over by $290,000 or at 125% with 14 weeks still remaining in the fiscal year. We continue to watch utility lines closely as costs, as you know, for fuel oil, propane gas, electricity, gasoline, and diesel continue to rise. We also have absorbed nine retirements this year and 17 resignations year to date. And we also believe we will have four more retirements and or resignations before the end of the year. The revenue report for 39 weeks, which includes the school department is currently at 79.8% collected or 4.8% over the target year to date of 75%. Some of our larger revenue sources are performing as expected. Automobile excise tax is at 69.2% collected which is 5.8% under budget. State revenue sharing is at 88% collected. Ambulance fees are at 87% <clears throat> collected. Uh, waste zero pay as you throw is at 73.3% collected. And building permits have already hit their revenue estimate for 2022 and is at 101% collected. We continue to review the budget weekly and make decisions on how to mitigate unanticipated revenue shortfalls and unbudgeted expenses. And that's all I have, Wes. Thank you. I think one of, one of the most significant points in that 
uh, brief brief report is, you know, the, the full time being at 66 percent and the overtime being at, at 125 percent expended. So each week when we're when we're looking at the finances across the especially the, the large public safety departments, we're looking at the combined resources of full time, part time, um, any reserves, if, if there is such a thing, holiday, uh, vacation, all of those elements in there. We, we I bring those those numbers back together and look at it overall as to the resources. Overtime is being driven in this cycle that we're in now because we're down 30 positions. I keep talking about the 30 positions and the need to, to fill those because of retirements and people moving on to, to other uh, positions. Um, that That's what's accumulating our overtime. It's not because we hadn't budgeted according to our historical perspective. It's, it's the lack of, of positions in there. So for those public safety departments especially, we have to backfill in the majority of that time. Um, other than that, things are reasonably on track. So hopefully that gives you a sense of, you know, in comparison to what we're, we're asking for and requesting in, in the pending budget development that we're under right now, as you can see that this year will close out very tightly again. There won't be a significant amount of resources that could be pulled and extracted or and put towards uh, other resources and or uh, allowing us to budget differently going forward based upon what's happening in, in this year's budget. Thank you. Do we have the numbers for the school tonight too on this? If we had to present, we could present up through February where we could do that. We weren't prepared to, but we could if that it was the request. Yeah, it was, I, was, I was in particular looking at it because I know there's been a lot of trouble filling positions. So I wanted to see how it was from your perspective as well. So do, do you want me to bring ours up now or later? Uh, I think we just have one more question. Um, Amy Garneau has her hand up. Um, so uh, city manager, you said that there's 30 positions that you have to backfill. Um, yep. Do you feel confident that um, you'll be able to backfill those? So um, one question I have is, will the overtime kind of sort of go away when that's filled and number two, how much of the backfill having to do would that part-time um, HR generalist um, be contributing to, to bringing those 30 people on board? So we have the, uh, let me, yeah. So let me go to the, to the ability to fill. Yes, we, we are, we are, and we do have the ability to fill and we, we are making uh, significant progress on that. The, the, the 30, vacancies is not a new occurrence ever since COVID hit we've we've been in this cycle um, wages have been driving upwards we, we we initially had certain people that that exited out during COVID they didn't feel comfortable working in the settings that they were working in any longer we lost a big sweep there uh, we've had huge uh, losses in both fire and in police uh, due, due to longevity People are retiring now. Uh, we have a very, we had, and we had a very aged workforce. If you, uh, Chief Benotti is on the conference here tonight to talk to you about the assistant chief's position, but if you, if you went down to uh, the fire department uh, not that many months ago when we brought on, uh, was it nine, nine new candidates all in one fell swoop, I felt like I was going back to school. Boy, it'd make you feel pretty old <laughs> to go down there and look at you, look at your gray hair versus the you know the youth of that new uh, level of service coming in, the, the staffers. Uh, so yes, we are we are filling those positions, uh, but we continue to be in that cycle of retiring out a, an aged demographic within our workforce. We've done everything within our power to uh, to plan for that that attrition. Made major modifications to uh, improve the environment within the police department, to improve the uh, employment practices there, to better attract police officers. We've made a, a memorandum of understanding with the council's approval midstream that's allowed us to bring on a, a multitude of blue pins, you know, fully certified officers that we don't have to bring on an untrained officer and put them through the academy uh, simply by making some changes in there that recognizes their years of service coming from another department over to ours. So we've had a number of, of officers come from other surrounding regions and pull them into our police department. So you have a known commodity of a blue pin. You have uh, somebody that's very experienced 
uh, and we, we're not expending uh, $40,000 to put somebody else through the academy if they make it, right? So there's all of those elements. Uh, dispatch center is, is a large part of those numbers as well. Dispatch, uh, dispatch. I don't think Director Tower is on the conference here tonight, but we had communications earlier today. I saw communications for the difficulty that Biddeford is having uh, and, and York is having in maintaining staff in their dispatch centers, which is the story statewide. Uh, it's ver been very difficult to maintain that staffing levels, but we do feel confident in this next year that we can hit that 22 mark that we're requesting in the budget this year. Uh, if you had asked me that last year or the year before, I would, would not have been able to say with confidence that I could have hit the 22 mark. And I think that's one of the reasons why the council supported um, funding from 22 down to 20 last year. Uh, and the council has been supportive of going to the 22, that's thus their allocation of ARPA funds. How does HR generalist uh, play into that? That position was specifically hired because of this extreme outage during the COVID period of, of time that we've had. The staff has been consumed dealing with the COVID impacts. Um, so we brought the HR generalist on board to to help with the uh, the busier work in there. You know, the filing, the the uh, once once the oral once the advertisements are written, getting those out, and the the advertisement of those, the collection of of resumes that come in, it's huge volumes of resumes that come in, getting those sorted, starting the scoring process, uh, making determine uh, as part of the team that makes determinations on who to call. And what, you know, once we make the determination, somebody needs to call, schedule everybody for oral boards and interviews, uh, this, the uptake pro intake process, the training that we're required to do before somebody new can come on board. So it's been rather overwhelming because this 30, 30 position outages, the historical years prior to this, we, we might hire three to five people in the course of a year, as opposed to 30 on a rolling, ongoing basis, not a one-time flux. So that's, that was the need and the justification that where we took uh, some of the unspent full-time resources because of the outages, and we allocated that to create that part-time position in the department. The HR department asked for that position to go full-time this year. I backed that out as my recommendation under the pretense that I believe that with the COVID backing down to the level that it is currently, that taking that amount of workload off would allow me to keep that position part-time as opposed to going full-time and, and keep up with the workload that's necessary to replace our workforce. Thank you. I know that we talked last week about maybe um, taking that out, but I thought more about it this week. And I think in order to get to where we want on the staffing levels, we really need that person. Thank you. And that, but I, I want, and this is also, again, I, I want to double emphasize what, what I said, you know, that position is there because of this, this, this point in time that we have this, um, difficulty in, in the hiring and recruitment. If that need goes away, we may likely be able to discontinue that part-time position. And I'm not seeing that on the immediate horizon, so thank you. All right, did we have any other questions um, from any other committee members for the city manager? All right, seeing none. Um, so Cheryl, yeah, if you want to take over and provide those, your updated numbers, that would be great. Sure. Um, Steve, am I able to share? You should be, Cheryl. I, I set you up as a co-host. Okay. Let me get to a point where it looks good. So can you see my screen and it says Stanford School Department dashboard? So uh, this is our dashboard that I actually just created. And I, um, I think this first graph actually does tell quite a bit. Um, what it does is it takes um, what percentage of our budget was spent last year, multiplies it by the current year budget, which is that first number, because everything we do 
it's a little different because no, we don't have any salaries during July and August. So it kind of, you can't go by what percentage you have um, for expenses for this year. Um, not like the city side where it's more consistent, but because July and August always gets, gets posted to the prior year, it makes the percentages a little different. So I created this dashboard by taking last year's what we were for expenses to budget last year and use that against our current year budget. So as you can see, our budget, um, we're slightly over the budget based off last year's percentage. Um, so the reason why that is, is that um, one, we've seen a, an uptick of getting um, invoices sooner than we did last year, like transportation was a good one that we were always kind of behind due to COVID. Um, they were, had staffing issues and so we didn't always quite get the invoices on time. And um, also um, uh, outside placements was another one that was always behind in billing last year. So the expenses were skewed a little bit. So that's why we're kind of ahead of budget this year, but we're right within um, a couple percentage points as we were last year. Um, for salaries last year, we were at um, this time of year, we're at 58% of budget. This year, we're at 61% of budget for salaries, um, which is I, you know a few percentage points and probably could do to COVID last year, we we're at a little bit of a lesser percentage. Um, and that would kind of ring true of why we had additions to the um, fund balance for the year. As you can see that prior year experience Expense compared to this year's is a fairly different amount. Um, and that's a lot of it's to do to COVID. Um, like we've actually spent pretty much all of our capital expenditures this year, which last year we had trouble getting things done. And we had a lot of things that got done like in May and June as things were kind of dying down. So um, our revenue was ahead of last year. Um, that it's really kind of hard to budget and most of it's subsidy anyway, so it comes in on a consistent basis. Um, I won't do any of the grants. Um, so then if we look at these percentages, we're running true to last year for the most part, we're running a little higher percentage wise than we did last year. And that was all COVID related, um, but we're running right close to what we did last year in how much we're going um, for our budget. I believe that we're gonna be pretty darn close to um, budget to actual um, this year. Um, we have a few things kind of running behind a little bit, but like subs, we have a teacher out, we have to get a sub and the sub costs us a little less, but usually we're also paying the teacher that's out also um, because they usually have sick time. So we don't really have a savings there. Um, unless they actually left and didn't have any time left. And we don't really have a lot of teachers that live that leave mid-year. Um, there's nothing blaring of savings that we've had this year. Um, if anything, we're kind of the costs are running a little higher. Um, we've been kind of watching some of our expenditures along just like the city is. Um, so um, when we look at our articles, we're running pretty much the same as we did last year on everything. Um, you can't really say there's one outlier for us this year. Um, we don't really look, we always look at it in the article format um, and we're running right along with last year. So, and that's where we are at. Um, if anybody wants to go and read the full um, explanation, it's actually um, in the in the um, Monday's packet for school committee. If anybody wants to go back and read this whole long memo that I wrote, <laughs> um, if you want to go back and look at that, but I think this is our big our big telltale right there is what. I think tells the story for us. Any questions that I might be able to answer? I like the color coding. <laughs> you know me, I like visual. <laughs> 
So this is a new dashboard that I created. This was the first month I actually had created it. So it's kind of just in process. All right, <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, I don't see any hands up. Uh, any committee members have any questions? All right. I'm not sure. Um, I don't have the little button to unhot un. Where did I go? That's weird. I don't have it. Oh, there we go. There you go. <laughs> oh, Cheryl, I, I, I unshared you. How's that? Yeah, my button was gone. That usually <laughs> says unshare. Couldn't get rid of it. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, so with that said, um, we can move on from um, agenda nine to agenda item number 10 for old business. Um, and we will start with the municipal adjustments um, that were requested last week by the budget committee. Okay, so uh, in your packet was the start of, of the tool that I'd like to bring up here this evening uh, that I hope will simplify the conversation tonight uh, to a great extent. Thank you for allowing me to, to present further detail on where we're at in this, this budget process and our request for amendments. I wanted to start the narrative. Can, can, is this large enough so you can see, see the numbers on your screens? Okay. Yeah, I can see. All right, so when we started in December, um, Ronnie and I, we, we, we start work with the departments. Uh, our municipal commitment year over year was up by $5.6 million. That's not the inc that's the increase in the municipal commitment. That was our starting point. We worked through um, part of December, all of January and February, and on March 3rd, we presented to you in, in detail the municipal budget uh, that called out for an increase of net taxation of $582,726. Since we did the detailed presentation to you, you as a committee have not had the opportunity to even, you know, in my viewpoint, act by consensus to, to adopt any, any amendments to what was presented to you on March 3rd. Also on March 3rd, I gave you a reprojection of revenue sharing, uh, which I uh, was able to develop because I got from an inside source, the revenue, share, the revenue forecasting committee's December 2021 numbers. I used those numbers to reproject municipal revenue sharing and I brought additional revenue sharing to you which if you, would, if you accept that at that point in time, would reduce the commitment to $359,547. On March 17th, uh, under old business, I brought to you uh, the newest number on state municipal revenue sharing. Uh, so it was an additional 370, 380,000. I'll show you those numbers in just a moment. When I brought those in with a couple of other adjustments, we were able to bring bring the um, the city's budget down to eleven thousand seven hundred forty thousand forty five dollars less in municipal commitment than the prior year. So hopefully the tooling that that I have here before you this evening will allow a quick uh, presentation that I can show you the story of how we got from five hundred and eighty thousand dollar increase down to. $11,000 under, and then give you the opportunity to make your selections so you as a budget committee can come out with your recommendations as far as what you're recommending for a budget. So on this right-hand side, I can expand these, these numbers out for you so you can see them more, more easily. This is the budget that I'm recommending at this point in time with, the, with, the, uh, with four budget adjustments that I'll show you momentarily. Uh, so that you can see line by line the municipal commitment, the dollar change year over year, uh, and the percentage for that category. You can follow that down through. And if approved in this format, there would be a call for a municipal commitment of $18,315,237. It's $11,745 less than prior year or a decrease of 0.06%. What I, we then created down here this is where I view the, the budget committee is at. 
we presented to you uh, on March 3rd a municipal budget that called out for an increase in taxation of $582,726 or 3.18%. And so now I would ask your consideration for um, four, four amendments and I can show you uh, what those are and what that does to the difference. So the first would be um, to accept the increase in municipal revenue sharing that I reprojected for the 21st, on the 21st, that's $526,079. You accept that, um, what, what the way the sheet does, it goes back and it re reprojects what's going on over here. So you can see if you, if you changed nothing else, you'd have uh, a municipal call up for taxation, which is $56,000 higher than last year or an increase of 0.31%. What the calculation down here on the bottom is looking at is it looks at several different categories. It, that would be an adjustment to your revenue, right? If you have your revenue, if you accept that increase in revenue, it's gonna show the increase in revenue down here for you. And this calculation shows what the uh, net decrease or increase of taxation would be pursuant to that adjustment. So anything you touch on this sheet is going to show that, as well as if it, it's an exchange in the expense, the appropriation is going to show over here, All right? So uh, the next adjustment that I would ask you to consider would be the reprojection that I received from March 14th. You saw that on the 17th under old business. That would that would wrap out the overall increase in municipal revenue sharing. That would then bring your side of the equation if you accept those with nothing else. They'd have a call out of taxation of just over $18 million. It's a $314,000 decrease from last year or a decrease of 1.72%. Okay. The other two adjustments that I did uh, when, when it became known that this additional 371,000 came in I went back to look in the budget as to what, as, as, as your manager, I had taken out uh, in, in non-compliance with future uh, past planning and council directives, I had taken out $250,000 out of the streets and roads uh, portion of our budget in preparation to present to the council uh, or the budget committee the reasoning as to why I reduced it by $250,000. That's all part of the effort of striking that compromise. Everything to this point, everything that's up here in this upper part of the equations that we'll talk about momentarily, including the streets and roads, was simply a municipal budget that brought forward all of the contractual obligations under the collective bargaining agreements, personnel policy, contracts that the city had out, increases in fuel, utilities, all of those areas, zero changes in positions, funding any position that was... Um, moved around, recreated, or brought on in the, in the current fiscal year, bringing that into the budget, that was the pretense under all of this, right? And that was to find the balance between uh, as close as physically possible, meeting the capital improvements piece that's pursuant to the charter and not, not over exceeding that from the 4% or to, at least not over exceeding it from the prior year in comparison as well as keeping an eye on what the taxable burden is uh, within our municipality, wholly expecting some continued shifting within our taxable base because of everything that's going on in market pressures. So as your manager, I have to account for all of that uh, and start bringing that forward for your consideration and the council's consideration in the future. So I wanted to restore the municipal road program and put it to the $2.5 million that it, was, that it was supposed to be and that projection was part of that $2.5 million um, three years ago when we brought forward a referendum bond package to the community and asked to borrow $6.2 million to start the streets and roads program, aggressive, aggressive in nature, and combine that with an escalating CIP year over year. And that escalation uh, was a half million dollars per year. So for example, this $514,000 negative number here, that's a reduction. That's the amount of money 
that I had to put into the budget in order to meet the $2.5 million over what the charter mandates. So the charter mandates that the capital program raise 4% of the combined city and school budget from the prior year, less the CIP amount. You take 4% of that, uh, which comes out to be $3,470,084. So in order to, when you take one half of that and you build it back up to $2.5 million, we had to put in 514958 additional dollars above the charter mandate in order to hit the $2.5 million. Because of the lack of growth in the revenues, I had taken $250,000 out of this originally to try and mitigate those impacts. And I was prepared to present to the city council on that mitigation for what I believed were sound reasons. So I ask you to consider putting that $250,000 back because as Director Hill presented under Public Works, you could see the impacts of the escalating cost. The $2.5 million at this point in time when we projected this years ago was supposed to be raising, raising us by one PCI point per year with the escalated cost of construction now we're planning a 30% increase year over year from, from this year to next on streets and road reconstruction work. Based upon that, you're going to drop to less than three quarters of a point per year if we stay the course for what funding the council had previously authorized and we went to vote a referendum on. So if you add that back in, we'll go back over and take a look at where we're at now. Now we're at a reduction of $64,645 or a negative 0.35%. I then had one other element since we started presenting to you. Our cooling tower failed. We ended up um, getting an insurance claim on that for which they will pay for a repair but not for a replacement. The council looked at an analysis of repair versus replacement, replacement looked at the lifespan of the repair versus the, uh, the replacement, looked at the depreciation on the repair versus the replacement, and decided to replace the cooling tower. The net cost over and above that of the uh, insurance claim is 52900 That's to be placed in the capital program. So I put that in. That wasn't a reinstatement. That was a new element. I put that in, brought that forward for your consideration on the 17th. When I do that, you accepted those. That's the matching lines. That's the $11,000 reduction year over year, or 0.06%. That's how I achieved my recommendation to you on the 17th. You can see that as far as new revenue, if you want to call this new revenue, so there was $897,000 that came in under municipal revenue sharing that we uh, year over year for two reasons. One, we went from 4% to 5%. They finally restored the state law back to 5% the way it should be. And we have had a significant uh, economic climate in the state of Maine. They have been collecting far more revenues than they originally anticipated. That is the difference between the December adjustment that I was able to project and the new revenue than when the governor said, oh, we're, we're $411 million higher than what we anticipated uh, in our last projection, was, which was December. So I waited to see how much of that was going to come into rev sharing, and this is what came in for us. So down here, what I look at is, uh, so this has a, a net reduction from the original budget that I gave you, which was up by $582,726. We've been able to compensate for that, and we preserved 66 and a quarter percent, or $594,000 of the new revenue that came to us for revenue sharing. <coughs> we were able to preserve that over and above these additional needs that I put back into the budget because the fiscal capacity, under my opinion, is there. We preserved $594,471 to create uh, a positive tax reduction for the, the ratepayers here in Sanford, or 66% of that new revenue sharing that came in year over year has been preserved to offset net taxation. That's how I arrived at the numbers that you, you see see below here tonight. So, are there any questions on that before I uh, go into further detail? Uh, 
everything that else that I have in this um, in all of these columns here looks at what the true impact is if you select any of these over what would happen in the in the municipal budget. All of these positions that you see here from the dispatchers to the assistant chief's position, police officer, mental health position, split E01, um, seasonal laborer, and the COPS grant, those are unfilled positions currently. They're new positions to the municipal budget for this coming year. The color coding represented here, the two dispatch positions, the city council has already told me they want these positions and they've assigned ARPA funding to it. That's why you see a revenue impact over here. The police officer, that's a directive. We want a traffic officer. I put it in the budget. Mental health, same reason we want that for the reasons that I explained to you, they've assigned ARPA funding to it. COPS grant, council authorized the application for a COPS grant. We apply for two officers, we're awarded one. This is the amount of money I can take out of the budget. If you don't recommend that, I have to take this amount of revenue out at the same time. For County Community uh, Transportation, for the first time, I am recommending their full request. It's $18,943 higher than what they were awarded in prior year, and that's based upon the uh, implementation of a microtransit system to address the major employment uh, bases outside of Sanford. Uh, that's for the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, Hussey Seating, and Pratt and & Whitney. Uh, so it would enable people to utilize the microtransit system as opposed to their private in individual vehicle. And that's in conjunction with our construction of the MDOT uh, predominantly funded park and ride that's gonna go at Emerson, uh, the former Emerson school lot behind Cumberland Farms. I have an option on here you heard uh, during public input a request for the restoration of the $39,000 that I, I took out uh, from uh, the trails program. Uh, that was in response to 20,000 has been hit their historical level of funding year over year for which they've been providing maintenance for. I said with our parks and rec, rec and direct director again today, there's been a rail trail, uh, rail trail task force set up to look at the impacts of the ATVs. He has written the policy that they will be coming to the city council. The, Property subcommittee will see that on April 11th, then it will subsequently go to the council. The big question I have in there is I know the ATVs, which have been deemed to be a high impact on the trail system, can apply for, have applied for in the past, and the trails committee has, has chosen not to utilize the funding that they can bring to the table towards a repair of the trails. That's why as your manager, I recommended the reduction of that 39,000 because it can come in partially or predominantly or wholly from the ATV uh, trails grant to perfect those repairs as we work on that policy as to whether they can continue to have shared multi-use in there. I also have the option for you to uh, reduce uh, the municipal road program just to the charter amount that's mandated there and do something differently from what was proposed from uh, years ago as far as the road ramp up is concerned. So that's how I've got this sheet set up. I would note several items on here. The dispatchers, for example, if you chose to uh, eliminate the two dispatch positions as your recommendation, I also have to check this column and take out $179,630 of opera funds. So that's gonna start to reduce your uh, overall increase in revenue and it will change your bottom line for call out of neck taxation. And for that particular example, pursuant to the uh, contractual agreement that's there as far as, uh, well, yeah. So on the dispatch positions, if you take those two positions out, I cannot uh, not restore, I have to restore the overtime uh, that's in there um, in lieu of those two, Two positions. So I can take $179,000 of expense out, I lose $179,000 of revenue, and I have to re reinstate $132,000 worth of overtime because that's what we budget now because of the two person shortfall. So that's an example on how this sheet will work uh, as you work your way through to make the various recommendations.
Mr. Chair, I'll turn it back to you for discussion on any any and all of these positions uh, that you might want to do to see what the impact are, um, positive or negative, as far as the municipal budget is concerned. Thank you. Yeah, we appreciate you taking the time to do this. Um, we do have a couple of hands up. Uh, Councillor Hurley, I saw yours first. Um, yes, so um, given that the city council has already approved much of the blue stuff, um, they're probably gonna support, continuing to support those, especially with the ARPA funds connected. So if I were to make a first recommendation at starting to go through this, I would I would tend to include those the blue highlighted items. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, Councilor Hurley, uh, Deputy Mayor Hurley, I would point out. So, if 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 the consensus of the committee is to support these, I, I don't put any X in here at all because they're already in the budget that was presented. That five hundred eighty-two thousand had all of these positions in there. So, this whole because section this, is in the budget you're presenting tonight. Correct. Correct. But Including the restoration of two firefighter paramedics, which was not in there last week. Correct. The, the the two firefighter paramedics were not. I'm 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 making my recommendation that, and I have the, the fire chief here to speak on this tonight. This is the assistant fire chief position. This is one of the most important pieces for me personally as your manager for your consideration. And I do have the chief here, and I and if you would give him the time when you get to this item, uh, it's about a two minute piece on this. He'll speak as to why I feel this is so important. And I feel this is in lieu of the two firefighter paramedics. So when I look at addressing the overall staffing needs of that department, we've gone from 10 per shift to 13 per, uh, to, excuse me, 12 per shift, where four, four firefighter paramedics off the 13 goal. We do have an application in for four firefighter paramedics uh, under the Fire Act grant, which if awarded and unamended would be four firefighters four firefighter paramedic positions uh, for three years fully funded. We can, we can, we can, I'm banking on that, given all of the money that's flowing federally, I'm banking on getting that award. So in lieu of- oh, Could, you know, could I just I, clarify something? Anything in the positive in this category was not in there then? In the positive. So the 198 uh, all, of, all of these- all of these elements are currently in 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 the budget. So uh, let me you know, let me I, I understand now. Yep. So this this is in the budget. The two dispatch positions is in the budget. The two uh, the overtime is not. That was taken in the out. positive. Okay, thank you. Correct. That that Correct. clarifies it all for me. Okay. Right. I don't know if it does for anybody else. I can pick it up quickly. He can go through it for everybody else. If uh, you see what so, I'm saying. So the fire the fire chief is in there. So if you eliminate that, I take 146,000 out. But per the contract, I need to put in two firefighter par paramedics. I got to put 198,000 back in. Yeah. Police officer, I, uh, take that out. There's no trade-off there. It's it's just gone. But the council has supported it. Uh, the mental health officer, I take that out. But I lose the opera funding. So it's a no no change to net taxation there. A public works split position. Get rid of the the part time part time position. Put in a full time position. Share across two departments, um, but I would need to put back the part-time position that I eliminated in lieu of putting in that full-time position in. Seasonal laborer, they continue to rob from the workforce of our parks department. There's too much work there. I need another seasonal laborer in the cemetery and I can hire one for there. Uh, and then we have the COPS grant officer that the council accepted the grant on. Um, and I've explained York County Community Transportation. But more is correct. Anything that is in a negative on that column is currently included in the budget that was presented to you. In that section. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, so if we wanted to see adjustments out, we would click on it. And if yep. we wanted to see adjustments in, we would click on it. Okay. Got yep. it. And if you want to leave it alone, you don't do anything to it. All right, uh, Councillor Brink has been waiting patiently. <laughs> Maybe not patiently. Um, Steve, if I understanding and, and I can easily be wrong because this is really my first year doing a lot of this. Um, do 
as a budget committee, are we supposed to recommend now and maybe even vote on accepting the $897,371? Is that a step that we have to take? I, I believe so, yes, because I presented you a budget that was up by $582,000, right? And, and I gave you all of the detail on that. Everything after that presentation has been amendments. You know, the 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 new revenue coming in under revenue sharing was not in that original presentation. It's come since that period of time. And differently from the original budget that I presented to you, I have gone back because I feel that there's the fiscal capacity to do this, and I've reinstalled the $250,000 to come up to the $2.5 million and the council authorized purchase of the, uh, the net cost for the purchase of the Cooley Tower. I've put that back in. Okay. So then all of these other positions are already in your budget. You know, if you don't support any of those, we'll, we'll select that and see what your impact is and take it out. So to get things moving ahead, should I at this point make a recommendation that we accept that money so that we can at least go on knowing that we're going to accept that money? You're going to start by doing, doing the revenue piece. It, it seems like a positive step forward. And sorry, can I ask one clarifying question as a follow-up to um, her question? So is this all done in one motion where we would then read the totals for the revenue versus um, expenses versus net taxation? Or do we have to do that piece by piece? So would we have to make a motion for the revenue adjustment first and then move on from there? Well, it, Chair, this is your committee. You can do it any, any way you choose. Here, here's my recommendation. I think to simplify things, okay. if, you, if you accept pieces, like uh, Councillor Brink brought forward a motion to accept these new revenues, if you accept those first, right, I, I'll, I'll take, take these out, the, the road and the cooling tower adjustments. You can accept those revenues and look at wh where you stand and, and how you feel about that. And then you can move on to other pieces in this. Once you've finished your motions, you're going to come up with a finished product that I'm going to be able to give you a summary of. Over here are going to be your dollar amounts uh, as you as you uh, accept those tonight. Okay, and, and I only ask because I don't remember in previous years making the separate motions just based on the revenue adjustment and. We usually Thank make you. a big motion at the end of these. Okay. And, and, right. Yeah. Yeah, right. I was going to uh, say, that's my question. Wes, could be my bad memory, but yeah, Wes, what 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 we usually do is is discuss the the ins and outs and all around, and <clears throat> generally come to an amount as a as a committee that we uh, kind of all agree to. If we have to, if we have to, if we have to have different motions, uh, you know, we want to put this in or take this out and see if that's supported and we can do that but eventually we'll get to a bottom line and then that's when we make the big motion so to speak which okay. uh, we provide the numbers then to ronnie that uh, that moves on i still have one more question too okay kenny um under the assistant um uh fire chief the reason i was asking about that one wasn't to cut it, the whole thing was I thought there was already a partial position in there. So we didn't need the full amount of money to support that position. I thought we already had somebody uh, doing some of the billing and that person <clears throat> resigned. So wouldn't we still have that position, that money in the budget or do we need yeah. both positions? So let me, let me, let me clear that up for you. So what's taking place in the fire department is uh, Betty Smith, a long time, time employee for the, for the city. She was the administrative assistant there. We, when I first started, we had an ambulance billing department. It was Betty Smith and one other, one other individual. Uh, because of the change in the volume and the complexities and changes within the CMS system, uh, we were having extreme difficulty in maintaining billing in-house. Become too much of a workload. So we did an analysis at that point in time and looked at contracting that out. We did a bid, we, and we, con we awarded the contract to Comstar that does our ambulance billing now. The um, 
that billing position was taken out of the department and, and went away. Left us with the administrative position, uh, administrative assistant position. Since Betty Smith had worked in the ambulance billing department, do the coding uh, aspects and such into that, we as an organization still need to do um, quality control and quality assurance, QA, QC. What that, what that means is when you have your firefighter paramedics out in the field, uh, they're literally rescuing somebody's life, they're, they're doing medical coding. I mean, you, you, you realize as somebody in the medical field, you're doing all of that coding just, just like a physician in Epic is tasked with, you know, paying attention to your needs and stuff, but that becomes the, the interface between what goes into the system and what goes into the system goes to what we can bill. So we do internal QA, QC in order to ensure that our billing company has accurate and complete information. If they don't, that bill gets kicked back. It gets denied from the insurance yeah. carrier. Uh, we, get, you know, we get questions from uh, the, the, the individuals who are billing and such under that. So even before that information goes to the billing company, we need to do QA, QC. The person with that technical expertise is no longer with us. Signed out, she's taken another position. In reviewing, no different than we do for all positions, when we did the review, there was too much on that person's plate within that department. So you reach a break point where you reassign when you don't have enough people to take on all of the work tasks, you continuously reassign that onto the existing workforce. We hit the break point. So we have hired a new administrative assistant in Betty's position. So there's there was no lost position via this move or, or such into that to save money on. We've hired a new administrative assistant who is training up in, in all of these areas, does not have medical coding uh, in her background, and it would take quite a period of time to do that. So when I look at the overall needs of the department, my position is, and the chief's willing to speak on this, he's got a, a good some numbers that support why, um, it's the it's the uh, restoration of assistant chief down there to focus on the the EMS side of the equation, do the QAQC, uh, and pay attention to the training because of the sheer uh, change in what it is that we do down there, the shift in in the focus of that department. So, if you want, I can have the chief speak on that. It, it taking probably about two minutes to to speak on what he's got. Chief Benotti. Okay, hang on a minute, get my video back up. Sorry about that. So um, thank you folks for letting me speak tonight. Um, I just wanna bring some things forward. Steve did a good job explaining the difference in positions. Betty's uh, expertise was um, uh, something we wasn't, couldn't replace and we miss her dearly in that respect. Uh, but going forward, we'd like to bring not only what she was doing into the, um, forefront, but also a number of the other things that uh, we're lacking within our department. So I'm quickly, I just want to, before you see in 1972, 30 years ago, the department was made up of 40 firefighter EMTs with a few medic, medics mixed in, an assistant chief and a chief. Um, they did 2,377 total calls, 1,380 of them or 56% of them were medical requests. And so each day they did roughly about six and a half calls a day. Uh, this last year in 2021, the Sanford Fire Department is made up of 100% cross-trained firefighter, EMTs and paramedics, uh, still has one assistant chief and one chief that all handle the operations of the department. Uh, this last year we did 4,128 calls for service and, they were, and out of those 3,233 or 78% of them were being medical requests. So in the 30 years, we went from 40 to 48, about 20% 20, 20 increase in personnel, which has only happened in the last few years. And yet our medical requests increased by 134% with a 514% increase in fire department support for medical operations. And that yielded up a total overall call volume of 
Uh, we presently do over 11 calls a day on average. So that's 365 um, every, every day of the week sort of thing. And some days are 20 some odd calls and some are five, but it's 11 average. So this increase in the work volume coupled with the expanded treatment options given extensive training and requirements and billing requirements, the, and the vehicle readiness has not kept pace. So I'll give you a little few statistics in the training aspects. Uh, presently, it's a 600 hours of classroom for our paramedics. And then they have to do another 650 clinical hours before they're allowed to act as a paramedic once they test out. So with that, uh, we have nobody overseeing that directly on a day-to-day -day basis uh, to keep track of these two new paramedics coming in, giving them the updated training and mentoring that they need. We have to split it over many different ways and sometimes have to go outside the department to make that happen. So that being said, um, the need for the dedicated EMS training management position is paramount in the city at this time. Uh, because the, the loads of the chief officers presently there are already maxed out. Um, the state and federal requirements for our department are extensive, complex, and require constant attention in all aspects and legalities. And uh, in order to keep us to the optimum billing return, um, we need to do everything correct. And um, so we presently bring in over a million dollars to the city. Uh, over the last three years, the fire department has provided over $288,000 in added revenue above and beyond our listed projections for those years. And this year, we're on track to bring $355,000 above this year's projection alone, yielding over $1.3 million when we close out the books at the end of June, if all stands true through the end of the year. So for a number of years, the department has had not had the resources it should to render the service to the city that it requires. Uh, this time, I think it is an optimum time to invest in our services for the overall health, safety, and protection of the city. And I ask you to support this position. And I just gave you a snapshot of the medical training. Uh, also on that medical training, every employee has to do eight hours of protocol updates every year. Everybody has to do recertification training each year, of which the paramedics, that's 60 hours for the paramedics to do in order to, to be recertified every two years. But the firefighter training beyond that is, is averaging about 360 hours per person per year at a minimum. And so that's over 17,000 hours of training as well. So you can see our, our job is becoming more complex each year. We're not just guys who squirt water anymore. Um, our medics are some of the best in New England, um, and they save lives every day. And, but with it, is it an expense and a lot of training and a lot of upkeep, and it's for the benefit of the city that we do this. And now what we're asking for is that third um, chief's position to assist both Chief Arnold and myself to keep that training at its premium and bring everything into line and also keep that solid quality controlled revenue stream for the city because that revenue stream comes right back to the general fund and it helps offset the taxes. So uh, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions if you have any. I know I threw a lot of numbers out there. Uh, part of that, that number of 514% increase, not every um, ambulance call is handled with two people. In fact, the majority of them now are handled with more than two people. And that's why there's a huge increase in the fire department support. So people who rather than just one ambulance with two people, it takes more than that to handle some of the medical calls. So I'll stop there. If anybody has any questions, I'm more than happy to answer anything you might ask. So, so Chief, who's doing the, the QA and QC right now and managing the trainings? Since, since Betty left in uh, end of January, uh, Chief Arnold, uh, Assistant Chief Arnold and myself have been splitting that work, trying to get it done as we can. And the training aspect, Amy, um, is being split over a number of different people within the, the department right now. And the problem with that is they are, they are listed instructors. The hard part is bringing all the numbers, all the training, keeping all of it up to date, knowing who needs what. I mean, we can put on training classes with different instructors each day, but the aspect of correlating all the information so that everybody meets their recertifications and that sort of thing, there's no person there that coordinates that. 
So we're tossing the ball back and forth between Bob's office and my office amongst the other things that we do each day. Right does, now. does that result in overtime? Like if they're, if they're training and they're not, you know, do you have to fill, like if they're, they're not on, they can't, you know, go out to a call if they're training. Are they most, part? Of, most of the training that we do is on shift. So their training gets interrupted each day. Um, we have done some training in the past that we budget for that requires people to come off and they get paid overtime to do, but that's usually a specialty type training, but that does not happen very often. Do you ever have to bring in like other trainers from other, um, you know, like, I don't know the right yes. word, but like, yes, like you know, like somebody yeah, from answer, Alfred or somebody from Waterboro that's a trainer. Uh, yeah, the answer is yes. We work, uh, Art Cleaves at York County EMA has helped us through some grants and stuff in the past where we bring in for our annual hazmat refresher class this is that go on. We have a top-notch person that comes in and does that. That's an outside contractor. And we do have other outside contractors. We just re-upped everybody's CPR card within the department. We had to pay for that. We had an outside contractor that came in because presently we haven't had the ability to send anybody to uh, instructor's school to get their CPR instructor. So. so potentially like this role could save from having to bring in outside resources. Oh, absolutely. Because this person the prerequisite for this position is that they have to be a paramedic and they have to be an instructor and they also have to be a chief officer certified. So we're putting a lot on this job description to fill those roles. So there's going to be a, um, a lot of um, hats this person will wear that will fill in the, the gaps in the department quite, um, quite well. Okay, thank you. Councillor Stackpole, I appreciate your patience. I know you've been waiting. Oh, he looks, he looks frozen. He's frozen, yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, Councillor Stackpole, if you could uh, <clears throat> just let us know once your connection's back or if you can hear us speak up, um, we can go back to your question. If, if I could also speak to um, uh, Amy's uh, response. <clears throat> the, the other thing uh, that's critically important, Amy, is when... Um, Department of Labor, you know, you think of them as OSHA, as the Department of Labor that oversees our workplace safety and such under that. Uh, I think it was my second year here, might have been even the first, uh, Department of Labor came through and went through every department. And I tell you what, that is a, a tense number of days, right? They go through every record that, that's ever known to mankind. And one of the big bumps in that road was uh, we had we had all of the training records and such under that for the fire department, luckily, but it took a significant amount of time to locate those because it was scattered across multiple hands. Difficulty was there was there was not a single position in charge and such. So we, we came out of that and after a lot of work and a long period of time, we struggled to keep to that same point if they were to do the same type of audit for us again today. Tough giving the staff numbers that we have. And just, just to add to one more thing here is I, I'd like to offer that we are uh, a 50 person department with only true, two uh, administrators trying to, to deal with the workload within that 50 person department. So, I mean, some of the other departments within the city have uh, more help than we do. Uh, we do wear two hats. Uh, we do the medical and the fire. And as a result, I told you about the hours of training that we have to keep up with. It's not like we can not keep up with the training. It's most all of it is mandated. So. Uh, Deputy Mayor Hurley. So is there some, is, am I hearing that you have this administrative assistant you've just hired, and this would be would have been a preferred position. So, are we giving up this administrative assistant? So you're just adding position. This seems to me this seems like an awfully expensive um, position. Um, it, it seems like there there's probably a more efficient way to do this without a title attached to it, which adds money. 
Um, like maybe there could be a training officer brought back in or, you know, it's, I don't know, it's, you know, it, it seems like an administrative assistant did something, some of this before, and now it's, you know, still keeping an administrative assistant, we're at, you know, we're all of these duties, is there really that much to put into $146,000? And I know this includes benefits position and I'm having a hard time with this one. Um, I look at that, I'm like, oh, 146,000 when I could, you know, have the two firefighters for 198. It starts to, it's expensive position. And I'm wondering if there's a more cost-effective way to do this. Um, a couple of, to answer a couple of your questions, um, counselor. Um, uh, Jody, the new administrative assistant, has her hands full as, she's, as we work every day. She is doing what every other administrative assistant does throughout the city between keeping track of payroll, paying bills, and handling the regular clerical type of things that go on within the department there. Uh, Betty had that extra skill set, and one of the reasons Betty left was she was burnt out. She was doing too much within that. So... Um, yes, your aspect of we're just, if we're just looking for a clerical person to do this sort of thing, there could be a cheaper alternative, but the, op the operations of a qualified training officer and having that third chief officer to help with the administrative duties of the department on a day-to-day -day basis is paramount. Right now, we have um, nobody that directly oversees our fleet. We split those duties. So as a result, some miscommunications and things go on within that fleet aspect. You've heard me talk about the training aspect. If, uh, if I go on vacation, then Bob has to be on call 24-7, 365 till I get back because one of us has to come back for any and all larger emergencies within the department because we have no chief officer assigned to the shifts. We go home each night at five o'clock, but we come back at two o'clock in the morning too. So I'm on call 24-7. And uh, with the advent of a third chief officer, we can then release one of us so there would only be two people who would have to come back necessarily rather than all three. It allows easier for vacation, allows for a little bit downtime, um, that sort of thing as well. The workload is there. I, don't, I wouldn't come before you and ask you for this position if the work wasn't there. And I think, and I, I think this was the time to ask for the position because of the way the city's budget is sitting coming into this next year. Um, it's like a house of cards. Eventually something's gonna give and a thing. And it's really been kind of stressful trying to keep things all pulled together uh, without the um, proper um, foundation to, to build from. So that being said, years ago, there were multiple chiefs. There were three or four chiefs within the fire department. And that was a different time when they just dealt with more fires than they ever did medical. But now with the complexity of what goes on with the department, and dealing with audits from the federal government on Medicare and that sort of thing, uh, there's more work than uh, two of us can keep up with at this point. All right, so um, can I ask a question um, of the city manager? So I see on the sheet, um, if this position, the assistant fire chief position, if we choose not to fund that, then your recommendation would be to restore the two firefighter, firefighter paramedic positions. I'm just curious where the overlap comes in for the for that work. Um, would those two positions be brought in because you need extra administrative or training? I just want to make see how I can make that connection for those. The city council agreed years ago, it's in the uh, contract itself, there's a specified ramp up of two firefighter paramedics until such time as the department reach, reaches 54. There's a, a qualifying clause in there that that's dependent upon um, the fiscal capacity and the council's funding those positions. So they have the ability to say no, and they have in the past, and grieved in the past, but the, the ability to say no is there. That's the language that's in there. Pursuant to my adherence with the contracts that are out there, I've discussed this with the chief. He's discussed this internally. The, the department would accept uh, the assistant chief's position, in which is not a union position, in lieu of the two firefighter paramedics, knowing that we still have the grant sitting out there waiting for four and or waiting for a subsequent year to move towards the two firefighter paramedics. So as your chief administrator, 
if the committee doesn't support these, I'm going to make an immediate recommendation to reinstate the two positions that I cut. I take the blame on this. These are the hard decisions that I make. I'm the one that gets called to the carpet. I would I would make a recommendation. You as a committee don't have to support it, but I'll be making a subsequent recommendation to put the two firefighter paramedics back in so that I stay as closely to adhering with the contracts that are out there as possible. All right, thank you. But you can also, as a, as a budget committee, you don't have to go with that recommendation. You can say that you don't want to fund either um, and go forward from there. Um, just so you know that that's an option as well. Um, I just, I, I got to, the hardest part I'm having is it's in a very expensive position and you would think, so the first thing that's going to go if the economy goes is assistant everything's administration because, it's, you know, you need the, you need the people who actually are doing um, close contact and day-to-day -day, like on the ambulances, on the fire trucks more than anything else. And, and that's one of the reasons I mentioned, have you looked at this position differently? Have you thought of maybe it could be, you know, as in lieu of, you know, just a firefighter paramedic, you have someone who, you know, does this position and is it what is there when necessary, should you have, you know, has all the training necessary to also contribute to the work of at least the very the firefighters, maybe not the paramedics. That would be too much of a burden. But I mean, that's why I'm, I'm throwing I'm throwing out different thoughts. I hate adding administration because inevitably, that's what goes when you have an economic downturn. That's almost all of what we cut after 2008. So I, I'm I'm throwing it out there. I think it, I, I'm so I just don't see why you wouldn't think of it. We're also used to doing things the old way. And you add positions at you know certain levels, and I always find it dangerous to add administrative positions. All right, and um, Lindsay, I believe you have your hand up. Yes, I just um, I tend to agree with um, Maura on this one. I kind of see two administrative needs is the one for the billing of the ambulances and then one for the um, training hours. So it seems like there's a little two different admin needs going on. And I'm just wondering if, you know, something like the training hours could be tracked by somebody like the HR generalist who is a part-time position. Is there, like I said, like more saying, is there a creative way to get a little more out of what we already have, um, you know, that ambulatory billing, I know can be a little bit more, is a little more complex and you need some, somebody with the medical side of things. Um, but I think that the, the, the training uh, hours are, are far more HR and just tracking. So um, I'm wondering if that's the part that maybe could be moved somewhere else would be my question. Lindsay, if I can address that a little bit, if I misconstrued the aspect of what this position is, I apologize. The I'm not asking for somebody that's just going to keep track of training hours. This training person not only takes care of that sort of thing, but they also set the direction and the course for all training within the department. So as we move forward, as every new thing comes around, things like when hazardous materials became part of the fire department years ago, we had to make that determination because we, we took that over because nobody else did it. And as paramedicine came along, we're looking down the road here to try and to create a community paramedicine program for the city to help save our taxpayers money through a community paramedicine program. We do not have the um, faculty or the uh, administrative staff to even think about that right now to do that sort of thing. So as we move forward, this person is also a chief officer in the respect that they have the authority to make critical decisions within the department whereas a training officer or a clerk or that sort of thing does not have that authority to do that. The uh, liaison with the state um, board of EMS and that sort of thing as well. So, I mean, it, it's hard for me in a short time here to explain all the hats this person would wear. But again, I go back to my original statement is I wouldn't be here asking for it if I didn't feel it was duly uh, needed. All right, and then uh, Amy, I see your hand up as well. Um, so, you know, we've talked about sustainability um, in several of these meetings, right? Um, 
City Manager Bach talked about it. So what Chief Bonatti said is that right now there's only two of them. And a third one would provide a more um, work-life balance. They could be on a rotation. Is that correct, Chief Bonatti? Yes, that's correct. So I think that, I think, you know, he talked about um, the previous admin assistant who was doing too much work and she felt overburdened. Um, so she left. So if this person comes on, could it potentially help lighten that burden? You know, maybe somebody, you know, that's, that's what I'm thinking about as well as I agree with Mara, it is a steep dollar amount um, because just for about, you know, 50,000 more, you could get two people. Um, but I, I also see like the benefits to having somebody um, of, of that level too. I, I would also ask you to go back to one of the statements in the piece of paper that was provided earlier we are bringing in a substantial amount of money. And so I, I think, especially this year, if we bring in another $355,000 over the projections that we had for this year, we're already paying for this position plus. And with the advent of keeping on track and a good relationship and a quality assurance and quality control program that moves forward, our billing should only get better and better. So I feel that this position would continue to pay for itself over the years to come as we increase the level of collections from the ambulance billing service. Ambulance billing doesn't come easily and uh, it, it requires a lot of work to make that happen. And I think this person is basically paying for itself. You know, we, we pulled in over almost $300,000 more than projections in the last three years up to this year. And then this year, we may pull in uh, another 355,000 just for this year alone. So I, I ask that you consider that as well. And in the, um, in the profession, is there a recommendation for uh, number of, of uh, or chief or assistant chief based on number of employees? Is there, is there a balance? Is it you know, 10 to one, 12 to one, eight to one? Well, it depends on what, what um, model you use, but you're looking for in the fire service, it's usually uh, what uh, supervisor is supposed to supervise anywhere from uh, five to seven under him. Now that doesn't include me down to the firefighters necessarily, but um, in this case, it is purely workload driven. And I think with just two people with a 50 person department, we're already beyond the max of everything we have to keep up with every day. All right, thank you. Um, so Councillor Stackpole, I see you're on. Did you have a question? It, it really, uh, I, I'm, now I'm trying to regain where we are in, the, in this conversation. Um, it, uh, I, I was gonna make a suggestion for how we proceed to get through uh, the spreadsheet uh, information, that, that discussion. <laughs> So, but you may have moved on from that, uh, Mr. Chair. So it, it may not be pertinent at this point. Um, yeah, you just we I, I understand we're discussing the deputy chief, new deputy chief position. Is that pretty much where you've been for the last five to ten minutes here? I guess I had a hard crash. I had to go down and restart my router and all yeah, that kind yeah. of fun stuff. Yeah, since you left, that's okay. um, that's been so, a discussion. So, Steve, could you put the spreadsheet back up for a minute? Yes. So what my suggestion was going to be, uh, with all respect, uh, Mr. Chair, is to just go through, uh, have a conversation, open conversation, and accept the municipal revenues or not accept a discussion around that. And essentially, every, get everybody on board with that. Then are we going to accept all the blue positions? Uh, because as Councillor Hurley, he uh, mentioned, they're they're something that the council is likely going to support anyways. Now that does bring us down to exactly sort of where we are. And I was going to say, you could start with a low hanging fruit and go with the seasonal laborer, or you could start with the, 
high hanging fruit, of course, which is where we are right now in discussion of the uh, deputy chief's position. But uh, then we ought to get everybody on board with what's in, what's out, and really look at the uh, bottom numbers at that point. So uh, it's just a suggestion, again, with respect to the chair. Uh, and uh, I don't have any questions for the chief right now. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, so I just wanna make sure we get through everyone's questions first. I, I do think that's a good idea. Um, thank you for sharing, Councillor Stackpole. Uh, I just want to make sure everyone is allowed to ask their questions first, uh, just in case it Absolutely. relates from a big picture standpoint. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Lindsay, I see your hands up. Yeah. So my, uh, it's more of a comment regarding the ambulance billing, and I, I appreciate um, Chief Finati's projections of that ambulance billing go up, but. Uh, through, you know, the proficiency of that person who's doing the billing, obviously has to get it right. Um, at the same respect, you know, I'm seeing the level of calls go up, which increases the billing, um, which I believe that social worker position with the police department would be going out on a lot of these sort of repeat offender calls or the frequent flyers, as you call them. Um, I would hope that as we implement somebody like the social worker for the city, we're starting to see some of these repeat offenders, the people that are getting called for the same things over and over again. Um, I have some personal relationships to people who are these types of frequent flyers and I, I it really is a sensitive spot for me, um, the tax that it has on the resources for you know our city and our small towns. Um, so for me, it's almost like we are increasing that social worker position and increasing the ambulance calls when really one should be going down and one should be going up. So I almost feel like those two positions, when you talk about the billing part of it, are sort of in contra contradiction to each other only because I would really, in a perfect world, that ambulance billing would go down as the social worker is helping our city. So that's just sort of an observation from my point of that billing part of things. All right, thank you. And um, Deputy Mayor Herlihy, your hand was up. I don't see it now. Did I was just gonna, have... uh, unless people had questions, I, th I thought it would be not a bad idea to take maybe a breather from this um, and maybe um, have a few questions about the PW Park split. I think, I think my biggest question there was, how many positions are we down in public works? And do you feel you'll be able to fill yet another position? I know why you want it, I'm just curious about that aspect the same problem we had last year with the two dispatchers where we like we cut it back because we didn't feel like we'd fill it anyway and now we feel like we could probably fill them so they're back in the budget plus we have the ARPA funds to get it jump started so I think that's my same question for the PW Park split I thought it'd be good to take a breather from the fire department a little bit as we all kind of process it okay so currently we're down uh one EO1 position uh <clears throat> not not counting this because this isn't on our books yet we're down one Equipment operator one position. Uh, we're we're down the split position between the airport um, and the public works department that that is authorized. So we're down two equipment operator one positions overall. That's a huge gain from where we started uh, at, at the first of the year. Uh, we have an unfulfilled uh, EO four because we've taken that off in lieu of uh, having our assistant director in there. Uh, and we're waiting to, to settle out as to we have <clears throat> an acting EO5 now. That position's been advertised and we haven't yet interviewed, but that's going to be filled internally. Um, if we do, <clears throat> that, may, that may cause a movement back down to an EO1 again. So how, how clarifying that is, and we're short one mechanic. Is it, no, let's see. Yes, we hired yeah, them. still short one. We hired the mechanic today. Okay, news to me, hallelujah. <laughs> so we're no longer down that, that mechanic position. Those have been tough. The only thing that allowed that to happen was the last negotiations changed that wage significantly. We're still not fully competitive with the private sector, but uh, obviously we're competitive enough to have filled it now. So we're, we're in a much better spot. The you know, so back, backtracking to the split position between airport and public works, that position will be doing the maintenance contract underneath the airport for the mowing of the solar fields and such under that during the summer months. Obviously, they're not going to mow solar panel fields in the winter months. They would then switch over 
be employed under the Public Works Department. We're seeking uh, to have staff enough to put people out on the sidewalks, at least two positions out on the sidewalks during the storms and not, not wait until after. We saw the impacts of that this year. Cities made the investment in the equipment. Um, <clears throat> and then this split EO1, this is in lieu of taking uh, one of the seasonal positions out that $10,800 and filling that with a year-round position to split between the Parks Department, which has been starved for labor hours, having extreme difficulty in getting part-time positions, especially for the, for the period of time that we need them. I'm, I'm the last person to talk about climate change, but when our long-term Parks Director said, my gosh, Steve, we're starting to mow much earlier in the spring and we're mowing far later into the fall, and we're, you know, we're picking up uh, some shared responsibilities with the school department. That's working extremely well. I'm very supportive of that. But it's just, it's more man hours, right? So when we used to have uh, teachers in the summertime that could work uh, part-time for us, don't have them in the shoulder season. You don't have them in the spring. You don't have them in the fall because they're back to work doing the full-time positions. And that's, that's why Matt's nodding his head. That's why we were talking about we need to do something different maintain uh, our, our growing acreage of, of fields. And so this has been working well for us. This is just in recognition that our ability to track that long-term seasonal labor is not there any longer, and we need to hire the positions year-round. Where do you find the efficiencies and the need to share them across divisions? I can identify that. So thank you. All right, do we have any other questions from any other committee members? Okay, so not seeing any, um, I think that it's a good idea to start um, as Councillor Stackpole suggested. I think we should talk about the revenues themselves, the adjusted revenue dollars that um, the city manager has uh, brought forward and put in the budget. So is there, um, I guess I'll ask if there is anyone who is opposed to um, accepting those new revenue dollars um, as presented by the city manager. So I'm not seeing any hands, I'm not hearing anything, is that um, so I just want to confirm that everyone on kind the of committee... hard to reject facts of revenue. It's, it's just what it is. Okay. I just want to make sure everyone on the committee is okay with moving forward with those uh, new revenue dollars. Hey, Mr. Chair, so if, if that's the case, when you accept the new revenue dollars with no other adjustments from what was presented on March 3rd, that would bring your net commitment down to a negative $314,645 or a reduction of 1.72% year over year. Okay, thank you. So then if you don't mind scrolling back to the left. Um, so now the items highlighted in blue, these are the recommendations from the city council. They're um, already in the, everything, everything is in the budget, so whether we want to take, okay. Correct. So is there anyone who wants to see any of those um, blue highlighted positions in column C removed from the budget um, before we move it forward? All right, not seeing any hands. So again, if anyone's having issues with the race hand feature, please just jump in. I don't want anybody to miss out on being able to provide feedback or uh, giving their opinion on the budget. So, all right, so seeing none, it looks like um, city manager, we're good with those positions being left in. Okay. Then do you want to discuss the white positions? Obviously you would not do the restoration of the overtime because you're leaving the two dispatch positions in. Right. Now you have these two white categories, the assistant chief and or the restoration of two firefighter paramedics. You have those under, under consideration. Yeah, so let's talk about, um, so I know we've had a lot of discussion about the assistant fire chief. So the new positions that are um, in the budget, the assistant fire chief, the, um, the split parks department position um, and the seasonal laborer, for the Oakdale Cemetery. I believe those are the 
three new. Did I get them all? You did. Okay. So then um, let's have discussion on this. Um, if So moving forward with this budget, uh, is there anyone who wants to make the case to remove any of those positions? Uh, Mr. Chair, I suggest you just take them one at a time. Just, uh, just speak specifically to the seasonal laborer, then move on. Eventually, we'll get to the assistant fire chief. Uh, I could do that. Um, I figured with only three that if we had anyone, so we'll start there. Seasonal laborer, is there anyone who wants to see the seasonal laborer removed from this budget? Not seeing anyone. How about the parks, the split parks position? Anyone who wants to see that removed from the budget? All right, not seeing anything there either. Uh, the assistant chief, the assistant fire chief, anyone who wants to see that position removed from the budget? Uh, Councillor or Deputy Mayor Hurley, your hand so up. Is um, I don't, I'd love to know if people want to see it removed or if there's, are they looking for some sort of a compromise to the number? I'm just uh, curious. Think, I'm just curious what people either. are thinking because it's gone a little bit both directions. Right. So I think for purposes of this discussion, uh, right. since it's not the final vote, right? So we can always make more changes as we go forward. We're trying to get ourselves to a point where we have something to vote on at the end of the evening. So, um, so I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, if anyone wants to see it removed or wants to see an adjustment, um, please uh, make your opinion known now. I think the number's high. I understand why they're looking for this position. I think the number's high. I wouldn't know where to go. I, do, I don't, I think it's like almost... You know, if you're looking at 100,000 booked for each of the firefighter paramedics, maybe 110 to 120 for, you know, it doesn't have to be at the level of the chief and the assistant chief on, on a cost, I guess. I guess that's where I'm thinking. Um, it, there's a part of me that wants to eliminate it altogether. So this is truly in men a mental compromise for me um, because I understand what the chief is saying, but I just think it's a very expensive position for what they're, ex what they're asking of it especially since they're keeping the administrative assistant. All right, thanks, Maura. Um, anyone else want to uh, comment on the assistant fire chief position? Yes, I'd like to just comment briefly. <clears throat> sure. The 146,000 that's budgeted in here for employee benefits and insurance, this includes a family policy and a family policy for the city of Sanford is $26,000. So we budget worst case scenario. So there is a possibility that we could hire this employee and they opt to pick the buyout option of $6,000. So the 146,000, like I said, is worst case scenario. I understand that that's all in there. That's why I compared it directly to the positions down below, I, which also include that same thing. So. And uh, so, Ronnie, is there a range for these kind of positions? When you ask for a range, are you talking their wages or are you talking employee benefits and insurance? The full package. So if you were putting this budget number together, um, if, if 146, 492 is worst case scenario, is there you know uh, a mid-level or something to that effect? I'm just curious. And I... I don't, hate to put you on the spot. So if you don't have it, that's perfectly fine. I just am curious what the range between starting and worst case scenario is. So I don't have the wage scale at my fingertips, but there is a wage scale. It's a low, you know, a medium and a high. Um, but we budgeted is the same pay that, you know, the current AC makes and with family benefits and insurance. So, you know, I can let the chief speak to that, you know, would you know, he'd be willing to hire somebody in at the lowest rate um, on that pay scale. You know, I'm not sure. So if you, if you look at the uh, non-union employee uh, 
wage and, and uh, wage scale. We plug that in in the, the same wage scale as the other ACs within the within the city. So it would be a standardized pay. I don't have the fully burdened sheet open in front of me here, uh, but if you if you look at the AC positions, they're all budgeted uh, the same. AC in the fire department and AC in the police department, they're budgeted the same. They're, 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 we don't have a range. It's a number. All right, thank you. So um, then Deputy Mayor, what I would ask is, do you have a number that you are looking to propose? I, I, I think part of my issue is um, the description doesn't scream assistant chief to me. So, and I think that's where I, that's where I'm hung up is it just doesn't scream assistant chief to me. We used to just have a training officer. We never had to, we never had an assistant chief. Um, and even that position went um, when the economy went down. So I, I, I'm not a big fan of over top heavy administration. But. Wes, um, the current position is budgeted as an E7 for 22, 23, which is a uh, starting pay of 88,000. So the bottom of that scale for an E1 would be 81,349. So you said from 88 to 81? Correct. Is that right? Okay. Thank you so much for pulling that up. All right. Um, anyone else who wants to weigh on it, weigh in on this? All right. Um, not seeing any other hands. So um, my recommendation would be to leave that in for now, as is. Um, recognizing uh, Deputy Mayor for bringing this up. Um, but without other comment, I think that that we should leave this in as we go forward. And uh, again, um, as we get through the rest of the, as the school and before we get to the vote, if, there want, if there's gonna be further discussion on this, uh, people will have that opportunity. All right, so um, so the blue, I think, so when I talked about the blue previously, I was, I was referring to everything in there, um, but um, maybe I didn't make that clear enough. So I just wanna make sure for the, the YCC AC transportation and the roadway and the city hall cooling tower adjustments, all items that were recommended by the city council. Um, do we have anyone, um, on the committee who would like to see those items removed? Oh, I wasn't gonna say removed. Do did we you add have a comment though? I did have a comment. I, I, I don't wanna lose any roadway infrastructure. I think we, we have a plan moving forward. So I wanna make sure we're covering roadway infrastructure and obviously the cooling tower, that's kind of a no brainer. My question really is on the trails. Um, do we have it in the budget now, or is that something we'd have to add? It's not in the budget now. Uh, it wasn't presented as part of that. I have $20,000 for the trails for their annual uh, maintenance as typical. They requested um, $59,000. So this $39,000 reduction was that piece that was specific to the rail trail portion. Uh, and that's what they... Um, right. And my, my concern was, you know, after we got that ATV rail trail um, report, is that really in order to have a shared trail, there needs to be additional money put into maintenance. That's what we got back, essentially. And that's why the Trails Committee requested this for the most part. Am I wrong? Wait. No, you're, you're not wrong. The, the difficulty that I have is that in in a past year when that ATV funding was brought forward, it was rejected by the Trails Committee. I may be speaking inappropriately, but mm -hmm. I believe okay. that was the situation. And I believe it can can be there yet again. Therefore, I don't believe that, that the taxpayers of Sanford have to foot that additional $39,000. I believe it can come from the ATV's state grant for trail maintenance okay. when done cooperatively. Emphasis, okay. and, and, and I believe you know what I'm talking about when I say cooperatively, I so it, yep. there was a lack yep. of cooperation there. So uh, Director um, 
Lloyd has written a um, policy that stemmed from the Rail Trails Task Force recommendations. He has that policy written. It's coming forward to you. And part of that is this shared funding responsibility mm -hmm. uh, okay. because it is the ATV years that have the majority of the impact that causes that fiscal burden. So adding this is definitely not a recommendation of yours. It's just, Correct. it was just from the public hearing. Okay. And the roadway Correct. infrastructure to 2.5 million to 250. Um, is that because of cost increases or is it just. Nope. That's, I, in, I support of, of that. that's in support of the original um, half million dollars increase per year until the city reaches a $4 million mark and then capping at 4 million going forward. Hmm. Uh, as predicted, this this was the year. This this five hundred fourteen thousand dollar amount, as we predicted, this was going to be the year that it truly caught up. So for me, as as your manager, putting this budget together, that five hundred fourteen thousand dollars over and above what the four percent raises in the charter, that that was a big one. That hurt, right? Uh, so I was prepared before the before the revenue sharing was restored to the level that it, that it currently is. I was prepared to discuss with you as, as a council and or the budget committee uh, de-escalating that ramp, but that is in violation of the previously established ramp of, of a half million dollars per year. So when, when the funding, the new funding became available and known, I went back and I recommend restoring that to get back to the two and a half million that keeps us on track with the $4 million mark we could not have predicted when this was put together uh, three plus years ago, the escalation in road construction costs. We couldn't have, we couldn't have predicted that. We're in a crazy environment right now. Um, but as, as we've been working on the race grant, MDOT says, we likely will never see these costs come back down again, even when petroleum prices mitigate the labor impacts, the steel shortages and such and that are going to continue to drive this. So. I would still strongly recommend staying the course of that half million dollar ramp. I feel that we can afford it given the, the revenues that are there. We can come in at $11,000 less than prior year. And, and just and just as a kind of aside to new members and stuff, it's a part of the reason roads have been so difficult and why we get potholes and why we have so many issues is because we have for so long underfunded our road um, annual road in investment in order to a continue to build the roads properly that have never been built properly before and to maintain them such that they don't become so deteriorated that they end up needing to be completely reconstructed so that's why we've been trying to get up to a sustainable amount that we can actually keep up with the maintenance on long term thank you and i will note that the the projection was done um in order to, to achieve that ramp was done slowly over time. You, you did the bonding and you added that to your debt service. And then you projected the ability of the community's ability to pay for that ramp over time. That's why it was done slowly over time by doing the one bond up front, you're gonna retire that debt service and then ramping that up. So when the debt service goes away, you're putting that debt service is gone. Then you're putting the $4 million in on the capital side per year. And over that 20 year span, you've averaged an annual input of $4 million per year. That, that was the long-term plan. Uh, so again, it was predicated on the community's ability to pay. I feel the community has the ability to pay. That's why as a manager, I recommended putting that money back in. Thank you. All right, thank you. Councilor Stackpole, I see your hand up. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, ask the city manager if he could get some clarification on whether or not um, the, that uh, what he what he stated uh, was was the correct answer that the ATV uh, clubs could in fact uh, get grants uh, to help uh, with with the, with trails uh, and I, I don't I don't really care in the past whether it was rejected or not just if they can get it. I think if the answer comes back that that's not available to them, that we need to revisit the 39,000. Uh, we can't do that tonight, obviously. So uh, <clears throat> if uh, I, I would say for tonight, for the budget committee, we just leave it alone. Uh, and then this is something the council can take a look at after you, you get the information, Steve. And so we maybe we restore some of this money to help with the ATV trails portion of it, if in fact 
the ATV club is not able to uh, get a grant uh, as you as you discussed. I, I think if the if the trails committee is turning away money, we've we've got uh, at least uh, an uh, an issue here that needs to be discussed with them. But that's that's for another day. I'll get clarification on that. Uh, we have, uh, they will be coming forward to the property subcommittee on April 11th. Okay. But I'll know the answer to it before that. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. And you, un you understand what I mean? Um, I do. Uh, that at least would, if we needed to, we could put some money forward to help uh, with the ATV impact on the trails, <laughs> which I think is appropriate. All right. Thank you. Uh, Melissa, I see your hand up. Yeah, it was just related to Council's point about if funding was available to the committee and they turned it down. I also understood from the comments in last week's meeting that they didn't seem to favorable of the idea of ATVs on the trails. So did they turn it down because they don't want to support the ATVs on the trail? So I just don't want the trails and the residents who live along those trails to get stuck in kind of a battle between this committee and the city council and the trails not get taken care of or any of the like the noise issues because they're not really interested and willing to take care of ATV trails. So if I think it's a good idea that maybe this needs to go back to the city council to decide what to do with the funding of the, the maintenance because if the city council does want the trails to be available for ATV, somebody's got to put money into it to keep it up. Yeah, so yeah, so let me let me address that for you. You're, you're absolutely you're where the council is at with the task force. So the the trails committee. The, the standing trails committee was having an issue uh, relationship wise with the ATV club that was formed and city asked the, the club to be formed to address the impacts uh, and, and ad also address the conflicts right of, of the multi use trails having that motorized piece on there. The, the ATV club feels that 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 portion of the rail trail is essential for that connectivity between the north and south districts of the town. So now that they uh, David parent. Um, Chaired the task force came out with with 35 different recommendations. Our new Parks and Rec director has developed that into a one-page policy. He's really condensed it. That has a, a lot of um, commitments on the city's behalf uh, towards uh, mitigating those pieces. So the the top statement of that policy has a recognition that the city council will support this, provided that the mitigating steps uh, uh, described below right, are going to address those concerns, the noise, the dust, uh, the damage to the trails that comes, and the conflicts of use. So that's all written in the policy pursuant to the task force recommendations. Um, and part of that is the financial contribution of the ATV club towards the physical damage that happens because of the heavy machinery that goes over the trails that wouldn't be there otherwise. Uh, in years past, the trails committee had not wanted the ATV club to utilize their grant funds towards repairs and maintenance because they didn't want them to have quote standings on the trail. You know, standings meaning they have an investment and therefore an implied in, uh, implication that they would always and forever have that use when a segment of the trails committee felt it was in conflict. So the first attempt is to recognize that there's 5,000 registered ATVs in this community that their needs need to be addressed as well, as long as people that like to walk the trail and such under that, and that you just don't say no to them until after all mitigating steps can be first perfected, right? And then at the end of that, if it doesn't produce the results, then I would expect the council to change the policy and consider something different than what's being proposed currently. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, Deputy Mayor Herlihy. I just forgot to lower my hand, sorry. For okay. the last time. All right, so then, um, so then um, city manager, are we, did we cover every item? I believe we have, but I wanna make sure I didn't miss anything. You did. 
that brings you down to uh, my starting recommendation. It's $11,000 less than last year, 0.06% reduction in, in net taxation call out on the municipal side. Okay. All right, so then, um, so the agenda right now is scheduled for us to um, now review the school adjustments and then under new business to come back and vote on both sides. Um, I think that's what we'll proceed with unless anyone else has a strong opinion on um, potentially you know, voting on the city budget now before we hear the school presentation. Okay. All right, so then now we will thank you uh, very much, Ronnie and uh, Mr. Buck. We'll turn the time over now to the um, school side and uh, the superintendent. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Steve, can you share the screen with Cheryl? Yes, Cheryl has share capabilities. So it is, um, first of all, I very much also wanna uh, thank the uh, Ronnie and, and uh, Steve on the city side. Uh, as they talk about, it's oftentimes, um, it's nice when you do have additional revenue that you can accept. And that was a situation I know last year uh, on the school department side, uh, when the decision was made uh, by Governor Mills to uh, increase education to the 55% threshold, which is um, by law, that was something that was uh, a big asset that helped the school department. And we were able to put that money towards tax relief. Last year, the budget committee was very supportive of the school budget as we were trying to do our best to navigate some really challenging times and some unknown times, but also do it in a way of trying to be sustainable and also trying to do something for us that we we're trying to also not have to cut any positions. And so when we're put 961,000 last year that we're able to go towards the mill rate to lower that mill rate and be able to uh, offer tax relief, uh, that was something that, you know, helpful last year, but it's also for us as a starting point this year. And that's hard, uh, as I already presented uh, in our school budget uh, previously, as we look at that, um, that's a hard thing to start with. But we also were very cognizant of that in terms of what we were looking for in a budget that we presented. Uh, Cheryl, if you want to go to the next slide, um, the budget, uh, this budget really is different from previous budgets because we were able to include pre-K expansion. And we also were looking at expanding the bridge program. And also, uh, as we expanded that bridge program, um, and also moving, um, recommending the moving of community adult education out of Anderson Learning Center back to the old Willard School. Those are parts that are in our budget. And so obviously those might be the areas that you look at in saying that those are the differences when it comes to having to make sure that you're uh, really examining those needs and the benefits. As you look here in the slide with pre-K expansion for us, uh, based on uh, pre-K expansion for us, it would actually have a negative impact to this year's budget if we were to eliminate this pre-K expansion. And that is based primarily on two factors. One, the grant that we have um, um, uh, qualified for, that grant, as well as the increased subsidy that would also be coming by us uh, expanding pre-K. So if there were any savings for us in pre-K, uh, it would not be in this year's budget. It would actually be as we look ahead, when that grant goes away, um, we do look ahead to probably having three ed tech positions that would be um, coming on to next year's budget and doing that. Uh, it's the feeling of our school committee. It's the feeling of our uh, administrators. And I also feel like it's the feeling of the budget committee in previous uh, discussion that pre-K is something that we look at as, as uh, something that is uh, in the best interests of obviously our education, but also could also be a real asset to the community. 
So right now, as we went back to the looking back at our budget based on the homework assignment we were given last week, uh, our recommendation right now would be not to uh, look at impacting pre-K on the budget. Uh, Cheryl, if you wanna go to the next slide, uh, then also if we look at in the costs of the bridge expansion uh, for that, um, I think we look at that as expanding the bridge program as uh, with two possible benefits. The first and the most important one is the educational benefit that it would provide uh, to uh, <coughs> our district in terms of the students, obviously, who would uh, be impacted by that programming and also <coughs> the help that that would give in terms of the overall district by being able to uh, offer that uh, resource. And then we also think, anticipate that we look at a financial um, benefit down the line. Also, as we look at that with all the costs and savings that would happen from having to go outside, uh, outside placements in terms of where that is. The difference here in the bridge uh, program was if we were to be able to take that off, uh, we, as you look at the, the slide here, we are using, the, uh, we are using um, some reserves that we've built up um, through in special education. <clears throat> and oftentimes those reserves are really focused on for us that um, that factor of outside placements, because those of you who've had history with the budget committee, but also history with the school budget over the years, that's always been something for us as uh, has come back and really come back to bite us as far as an increased cost in doing that. So if we were, you would be looking, if we were to um, not have the bridge expansion, we could continue to have those special ed reserves and just have those go towards our revenue. Right along with that, we also have some carryover that we're looking at to be able to also use here for that move. And that carryover for us would be wanting to come back and use that to help with the upgrade of the Willard School that would be necessary for the moving of community adult ed and the bridge program. Uh, many of those would be one-time expenses for us that we think would come back in, in a sense, if you're going to be using carryover and being able to do that, in this case, it's not just be used as revenue, it'd be also be used to address and help us uh, going forward. But if we were to, um, to not uh, expand the bridge, you could also look at still having that carryover come over to the um, an impact in terms of the school budget as a revenue uh, with that. But it's still our recommendation that we feel the benefits uh, and the timing of this outweigh all of those considerations. So that is not a recommendation that I am making at this time. Um, if you wanna go to the next um, slide, Cheryl, um, one of the things that we've done uh, uh, since last week's budget meeting is a central office team. We have spent considerable time to go through our budget, our proposed budget in much more detail. We especially focused on those new things that were added to the budget uh, because that's where you oftentimes wanna start. Those were things that we presented uh, earlier in our presentation of the budget. As we look at that, we do feel that there are some recommendations that we could be um, recommending for some reductions. Uh, we did have something, this wasn't new in the budget, but as we did look at our professional development needs and putting those through another lens, we feel that um, there's 3,500 of that that could be used through our ESSER funds and title funds that would qualify for that professional development. Um, and if so, it makes sense for us to be able to move that. Uh, we also looked at our curriculum supplies, uh, our curriculum budget. As you know, uh, we try to plan that out for five years so that we can make sure that uh, it's sustainable and it also stays away from the high spikes that might uh, occur. We have a situation here that based on some of the ESSER funds and things that we were able to be able to utilize for those, we now have some funds opened up that we can be able to in this year's budget kind of pay ahead 
um, buy ahead in terms of when we're looking at those workbooks. Um, so we've got something where I think it's uh, 15,148, I think is what we were able to um, look at. We rounded that up to 15,000 here on the screen. The other thing that we had in our budget last year that we ended up cutting were library books as we were hoping to look at all of our uh, library books and be able to add new books to those libraries. Uh, we wanted to come back and be able to initially uh, put that back into the budget. But as we also look at that through the lens of, through our ESSER funds, we were able to do two things. We were able to replace books that we may have lost or did not come back uh, through the uh, COVID. Uh, and also looking at also purchasing some new li library books there. So this will uh, put a, a little bit of a hole for that going forward, but that's something else that we looked that we can transfer over to the ESSER funds. We did have a, a large, um, for the Patriot, Patriot Mechanical contract, in terms of what we were looking at, that was a high number in this year's budget that was coming back. When you look at that district-wide service contract, it was over $109,000. That was something that was needed. It's something that we haven't had in place uh, and it is needed. Uh, but as we look at that, we do recognize that that is a pretty big jump up in terms of when you go from uh, nothing to, the, to everything. And so as we put that through a closer lens, we feel like we can um, subtract one of the schools, the one we would be Pride Elementary. That was the one that was the latest uh, last renovation that we have in terms of looking at warranty and where things are. We feel like if we had to, we'd be able to uh, take that uh, and be able to reduce that overall contract down by almost $18,000. So as you come back and add those up, if you look at what we're putting back, uh, that's something with some adjustments to our budget that we could look at for $42,675. Um, I know similar to what um, Steve and Ronnie put together on the municipal side, uh, Cheryl has also kind of put together on our school side a little bit of a same type of calculator that I think if I put you on the spot, Cheryl, can you bring that up to see exactly if we were to uh, punch in those 42,675 to kind of see where that would be and what it would leave for the school on the school side? Are you seeing it on the screen? Yep. Okay. So my, my um, calculator works similar to Steve's a little bit. He had an X, I do Y's and yeses and no's. So um, if I take a Y and put it next to, a Y means take it out of the budget, no means leave it in the budget. So if I put a Y in, it actually decreases um, by that $42,000, which brings us down to 4.6%. In terms of where our, uh budget increase is. Um, I do, one of the things that's been important to us, as I mentioned, uh, we're looking at sustainability. We've been in a situation where we've seen some fluctuations that have happened when we've used carryover as revenue and not been able to hit those projections. We've also seen what happens in the fluctuation of subsidy in terms of how we've been able to come back and have to cut positions in terms of doing that. So we've done our best to try to be very thoughtful in terms of what any times we are having any additions uh, to the budget. I do know that similar to what Steve had talked about earlier, uh, that in my role as superintendent, there are positions that uh, have been requested that at the end of the day, you could look at and have been uh, are needed. But you can also say that as we make the hard decisions to also look at what that burden would be and what the, um, increase would be also, or the impact of the taxpayers, we do take that into consideration. We do have uh, two new positions in this budget. Uh, if you went back to our presentation, they would be the support in transition ed tech positions at two of our elementary schools, Carl J. Lamb School and Margaret Chase Smith School. Those of you who have been um, 
on the budget committee for a while will know that these support and transition um, positions are really important to the school department. Uh, we've done something that has had a thoughtful um, uh, expansion of those programs. We started uh, at Sanford High School. Uh, we also have a <coughs> one at Carl J. Lamb uh, at Sanford Pride, rather, and we have we've added another one at the middle school. It was our intent to be able to add those two positions at Tech to the budget last year. We then made the decision to fund these positions this year through our ESSER funds. And that's something that when you look at this position, uh, a support and transition, it's the ability for us to keep our kids in school. It's ability for the kids who are maybe possibly having a difficult time or could be possibly disrupting the learning environment that have to be removed. We now have a resource in the building that can be able to come back and do that so that it doesn't fall on either keeping that in uh, for the an impact in the classroom teacher and the classroom environment. It also doesn't come back to impact the administrators or situations where we have to call families. Uh, COVID has been difficult uh, for everyone. And as we've been transitioning back into our schools, these support and transition rooms have become very critical. As we went through the exercise of how we're trying to meet our needs and also look at how we can best use our ESSER funds to be able to help us keep our students in school five days a week, help them with any particular learning loss and also the various social emotional needs that are presenting themselves. We are now looking at, uh, as we review that, uh, our administrators overwhelmingly came to the pace where the support and transition are the most important positions if we had to prioritize and tier those. So considering that those were in line for us already to be coming into the local budget, uh, it's my recommendation right now that we uh, continue to keep those two positions in the budget and that we don't move those over uh, and kick that down the road any further with some of the other um, in, in, and fund those by ESSER. We also know as we're trying to maximize those ESSER funds, I already talked about the impact with the pre-K uh, grant going away down the line that for us, um, my recommendation would be for us to be able to continue uh, for us to be able to look at keeping these um, positions uh, in the, in the uh, local budget. One thing for us that makes it difficult, uh, our budgets are pretty thin and, and there's no fluff. And as you come back and look at those, when it comes time to be able to find those cuts, for us, those cuts would then fall on positions. And for us right now, we are looking at uh, all of our positions uh, are filled in terms of that, so that if we were to have to come back and make up a significant uh, impact, uh, looking at um, the figure that was given out at last week's meeting <laughs> of what it would be getting back to zero, for us, we'd be looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of cutting an additional six or 10 positions. And for us, considering where things are right now um, for, uh, our students and our community and our staff, we feel that would not be the right decision to be very short-sighted in terms of us uh, recommending any additional cuts. Uh, that would vary in terms of whether or not those positions are coming in from uh, teaching positions or if they'd be coming in from ed tech positions or um, administrative positions for us. We don't feel we're in a position right now to recommend those. But at the same time, I would be uh, very much uh, at the will of the budget committee uh, to make sure that we are doing our best to kind of meet um, uh, the expectations that you have. So that's, uh, Cheryl, if you want to kind of go back to the other slide of questions, um, that's kind of where we're at now. I'm open to any uh, questions that members of the budget committee may have, or if there's any other feedback um, as well. All right, thank you very much. Um, Deputy Mayor Hurley, I see your hand up. Yep, and I, I'm just gonna rattle through them. 
so first, one of the things that, you know, is going to continue to concern me is that the ESSER positions are not going to be sustainable long-term. And has there any, and one was the question, first question is, has there been any thought given to hiring by contract? So it's easier to keep tabs of it. It's easier to let people understand that these positions um, may lose their funding at, um, at the end of this process of, you know, recovering from COVID. Um, so that's one question. Um, I know we're going to eventually, I think everybody here really supports pre-K and the bridge program. And has there been thought to give in to ramping up the cost of pre-K over the period that we're going to have the ability to have the grant, kind of like we save for, is it the 53rd week? Every, you know, we save so much every year, so we're not surprised by that extra week that we get every so many years. Um, has there been thought to ramping up after this year, just, you know, add a little bit, add a little bit. So by that year, you've, you've built it into the budget, that pre-K into some sort of reserve. Um, so that is, we're not hit all, with it all in one year and you're not hit with it all in one year. Um, and also as far as the fund balance, um, there's, you know, there have been some people saying, you know, why isn't the school using more of their fund balance to offset tax taxation this year? So that's one of the questions is why, why have you chosen not to use more fu fund balance? And also what number is the max the school can keep as a fund balance? Cause I know the city can keep a fair amount but the school is maxed out by state law, I believe. Yeah. And those are my, so those are my questions. Yeah, I'll do my best. Um, I can remind you if necessary. Yeah, no, uh, I'll start with the positions that you talked about and the worry about the ESSER funds and in terms of what's going to happen to those when those expire. And um, we've taken that approach in terms of the positions that we've hired, and we hired a number of them uh, this past uh, summer leading into this school year. And we were very upfront with the people that we hired in terms of letting them know that this position was covered with federal funds, that it was not part of our local budget. We let them know what we had for funding. We also gave them an idea of, uh, we had three years to spend those funds and to also look at what the um, overall thinking <laughs> of um, no guarantees. And so um, I was um, in some situations, uh, not so much, I think with teachers or ed techs, um, uh, deputy mayor, but I think it was some contracts that we did work with. Yes, uh, when those were available, but the majority of what we haven't hasn't, but I sit here today, am I concerned about, um, obviously we make some great hires and those people know that they're on a um, being paid with federal funds. And uh, some of that is a worry that we could lose those people. That is very much uh, possible. I also know in other situations where there has been some other openings that have come up through some uh, retirements or other um, situations that those people uh, can also transition into some of those positions as they come open. <clears throat> so that's that's where we're at is there are positions in this budget that we're recommend recommending. And when you combine those with the ESSER, if the budget is approved, uh, we will be having conversations with some people about that and doing that in a in a timely way um, that um, at the end of the day, I feel good about and don't feel like people have, have been misled um, for that. In terms of the pre-K, one of the challenges we, we do look at for our pre-K, where we'll be able to expand our pre-K, because uh, that was something that as we were re-renovating uh, and expanding our elementary schools, we were looking at the idea of having uh, a, um, at least two classrooms of pre-K in each one of our elementary schools. What we're doing with this expansion is only going instead of six, it's going to three. And so by doing that, uh, part of that is not because uh, obviously we want to make sure that we grow it slowly, but one of the things driving us now is the space. And so as we have hired additional people through ESSER to keep those class uh, student to teacher ratios down, we're really maximizing the space in our classrooms in our, especially our elementary schools, that would make it really difficult to expand that pre-K right now. 
So as far as trying to be thoughtful and ramp that up, uh, that's uh, coming difficult that we feel in a lot of ways, the, as we know, as long as the, um, the, uh, the interest is gonna be there, that we can fill the 16 spots in each classroom, we also feel that that subsidy can help us uh, with it. The other thing we're looking at is uh, we also wanna do a, um, and sometimes our, our ed techs, ed techs are oftentimes really connected to special education. That can be very fluid. And so we'd wanna make sure that uh, we wouldn't just come in and willy nilly add those three, um, uh, those three ed techs for pre-K without trying to do a complete overhaul or at least a complete um, investigation or, or really looking into to make sure that there's no other ones that we might be able to eliminate. But we realize the impact that you have on budgets when you add new positions. And so that's not something that we take lightly and we always wanna look forward to say, are there situations to say, can something be restructured or something eliminated or something changed in order to be able to meet those needs? In terms of the, the fund balance, uh, right now, typically what uh, our auditors will tell us and what uh, state law is that they don't want you taking any more of 3% than your budget going for fund balance. Now, in the terms of COVID and what we've gone through, there has been uh, they have um, changed that, and that's something that can go over the 3%. Uh, as we've come back uh, over the years, you've seen us be able to use fund balance, uh, especially years ago as uh, we were really, um, when Gwen was our business manager and really looking at uh, some of getting the finances in order, we were able to do that. Uh, and to be able to use fund balance for our, um, for our um, budget and revenue, uh, that did come back to bite us in terms of not being able to meet those projections and coming in short. And so as we uh, look at doing that, uh, I'm careful with that. The concern I have right now is we have put funds in this budget uh, of fund balance going towards some of our expenses. I'm uh, hesitant to use any more because uh, as you remember last year, I was also hesitant last year because of what we were anticipating the subsidy decreases that we'd be having. Uh, we were bailed out last year by a change in a student teacher ratio. Uh, this year, they carried that over, uh, that student to teacher ratio. They made another change to help with the enrollment uh, decreases or impacts that people had because of COVID. And we also were able this year to receive funding that we were not anticipating because of a change that they made in the economically disadvantaged formula. And so as we look at uh, ahead to next year, if those and knowing that we've been in situations before when that subsidy goes away, that we would be end up uh, to make that up with that of having to cut positions and, and worried in a spot right now of not wanting to have to cut positions where our current situation is in our schools. We would be looking at um, next year um, using the having carryover so that we'd be able to use that uh, because in addition to those uh, things in the formula I talked about, Valuation is going up. Valuation went up this year and that impacted our, uh, our subsidy significantly. The projections that we've done, when you start to look at how they look at valuation and you see how uh, a three-year average, we're really gonna be hit by what had happened with the COVID in terms of uh, property values going up in Southern Maine, uh, York County, Cumberland County, when you had people that were moving from out of state to be able to come back and do that. So we, our projections, as we look at that formula, has us somewhere in the day that that swing could be at 1.9 million if nothing changes. And as of right now, I think it's prudent for us to be looking at that, to be prepared for that. Uh, and then if things do change, then that's coming back to be something that I think would be 
welcome it as opposed for us to be able to come back. So those are the things I had uh, more, I don't know, uh, positions, pre-K fund balance. Uh, Cheryl, is there anything you wanna add about fund balance in terms of uh, the what the auditors would recommend for us to be able to, um, to carry over? Uh, no, I think you covered all of it. Um, the biggest thing is that we're trying to leave 3% there for future. By right now, what all the usages of um, of carryover bring us down to three percent, and it also Matt that three percent comes to about one point nine, which, as I mentioned, has those projections. When you start looking at the um, increase in valuation next year, and if those changes to the formula with economically disadvantaged and the student to teacher ratios, if those were to be able to move. Uh, back to their other pieces, um, obviously that would have a negative impact on our um, state subsidy. So can I ask a question? Um, so on the fund balance then, uh, going to 1.9, I'm just looking at the original sheet. So are we saying it's gonna go from the 2.5 um, well, sorry, it was 3.6 in FY21 with 2.5 unassigned, but that's going to drop to 1.9 at the end of FY22? Yeah. Or do I have that wrong? Yes. Okay. And is that, that would be the ending fund balance? Yeah, I think I, I had that on something last week. Can you give us an idea of what 3% is? So at least we have a, an idea of what max I know you can go a little above max, but what the max typically is? The max is usually 3%, but they've upped it 5% right now. So the 5, 3% is 1.9%. 1.9 million. 1.9 million. And the 2.5 million is just below the 5%. Okay, and then, um, so I apologize, I wasn't here um, for your original presentation and I, I did have one question I meant to ask last week. Um, so in the interest of time, um, can you just give me the high level, the technology access points that were 154, 154,000, <coughs> um, what that is, if you would please. Yeah, the technology points for us as we've been through things are primarily looking at down at Sanford High School and Sanford Regional Technical Center for us to be able to um, be able to have the necessary bandwidth that we need uh, for our Wi-Fi to be able to <laughs> function at the level that is needed for us to support us having the one-to-one -one technology with all of our um, students to be able to do that. We're also looking at as we move adult education and um, the bridge expansion over to Willard, there are some access points that we have to replace there because we had taken those out and, you, and, and uh, put some of those in other areas throughout the school department to assist us in the same thing. So that's what we're looking at and feeling like as you're able to do that, that qualifies as uh, for us as a, those types of things. If you're going to use carryover that aren't going to be continuing on in your budget, but the one-time expenses that are going to be necessary for you to have the infrastructure that you need to support what you have. All right. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have questions? Uh, I see a hand, sorry, I'm covering it with my other screen. Uh, Councilor Brink. Um, would you mind explaining what the um, mechanical thing for Pride School is? And I guess you're taking it out. What does that entail? I'm not, I wasn't quite clear oh, it's, on yeah, it. It's really part of our HVAC uh, services throughout the whole district in terms of, uh, we made significant upgrades to those, and those would be the service contracts that come in, the updating of the filters and all of that. Uh, as we look at the what we've done in our district, that's something that we feel is very necessary for us that's been neglected. 
over time. We've always tried to piecemeal that to the point where it's coming back and ultimately really not probably being efficient or cost effective for us. So by able to do that, we feel like um, we went from not having anything in terms of that to that service contract. And that was a big jump. And so we recognize that. And so for us, realizing that Sanford Pride was the last one to come online as we our students started back in August there, we feel like if that's the one that we could be able to try to get by with without the service contract uh, at this time, just to help us in terms of um, trying to find um, trying to find potential cuts. Um, after being a principal in that building and <clears throat> knowing how educators, especially administrators, tend to pull money out of building maintenance um, in order to save the educational component, I would tend to put the um, 17,000 back in to the Pride School because I remember one administrator, business administrator telling me when I asked, put in my budget about clearing, cleaning the duct work on an annual basis, he said, oh, you never need to clean duct work. And let me tell you, Pride School was the junior high and we had an air quality problem. So I'm a little shaky when, even though it's just recently done, I would tend to make sure all our buildings were regularly done and we don't skip a year on anything. Um, so I, I'm concerned with what isn't going to be done in that building if we don't put the 17,000 back in. Yeah, and I, I, um, I understand that. Um, and I think that uh, uh, makes a lot of sense uh, for us. The challenge that we've had is anytime you're talking about budgets, it's some of these things that in, don't uh, appear to directly impact kids. And those are some of the things that can kind of get moved down or kicked down the road. And then eventually that's what comes back and comes back to catch up with you and bite you. And mm -hmm. I know as we looked at uh, the investment that Sanford has made as a community in terms of our schools, starting with the high school and technical center, but everything <laughs> we've done with the renovation of the old junior high to pride, the, the renovation of the old high school for the middle school, the expansion and <laughs> upgrade of MCS, that's been done with the idea for us that we also have to make sure that we are, um, that we are um, maintaining and being able to not let us fall back into those situations. So we're well aware that when you look at a budget and someone comes in and says, hey, we're looking at a $109,000 increase, that did not go lightly uh, as we looked at that. But I think we were coming at it from the same way you were, uh, Councilor Brink, and the importance of that and also the cost of that if it's something's not. As we looked at it, not looking at impacting it trying to go with one school. The idea would not be to have that school <coughs> be the neglected, but the hope would be that we would be able to go back and eventually uh, restore that as well. And also make sure that we'll have to uh, find our best ways to kind of keep up with, with that work. But you know, there, you're definitely right that, there, that by doing that, uh, there is risk and there is cost to it. I would also like to state that I thought the uh, municipal side and the school side did an excellent job with the budgets, knowing that even minimum wage is up skyrocketing. And I know you all have contracts and all of our budgets are pushed because of contracts. And most of the contracts are at least a 3% increase. Uh, so that's a big part of any budget. Uh, so I think we have to be aware of that. And and when I keep hearing cut down to zero, I'm like, no, if you cut down to zero, you're cutting out some really important things. And I also like to state again, how supportive I am of the preschool pre-K uh, program and that it gets parents into the workplace. It also gives some of those kiddos a step up in life because of being in a pre-K program. Also, one of the things we haven't talked about with the bridge program is we no longer would be putting kids on a bus, wasting time in their day to drive to an out of district placement. So I really appreciate the fact that you guys have come and you're developing a bigger um, bridge program. So I just wanted to thank you for that too.
All right. And um, so I know as far as asking for the 0%, um, basically what I was looking at was just the options, right? You can't make a decision if you don't know what that decision means. And if you don't know what gets removed when you ask for a lower percentage, then you don't have um, any decisions. And if if we were just to take the budgets as they were presented every year, then the I don't know why the committee would even exist, right? So, so that was the whole purpose of that is to show everyone, you know, what it means. What does it mean if we go down? What does it mean uh, to programs and services? And then you can really make that informed decision, right? So that was my whole purpose with um, asking for these changes to show what you know, what does that look like? What services get cut if the taxpayers don't um, have an increase? And, and then, um, and that allows us to be able to balance that decision, so. Yeah, and I, and I appreciate that and understand that. Please know that by me not offering up any positions um, that uh, other than what we're looking at for a number and that there would be, uh, that wasn't trying to be oppositional or, or um, uh, not trying to be uh, collaborative and cooperative, but it was more of those are decisions, as I mentioned, where people are in those positions. That would be something that would need probably some greater discussion for us on the school side in terms of probably involving, obviously, our elected officials in the school committee, but also being able to do that in a thoughtful way that also wouldn't be catching anyone off guard or surprising. So that was also part of my thinking in terms of not showing you a menu of positions that we are recommending other than it would be an impact where you would be having existing positions and people that would have to be um, cut. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and, and I agree. I think um, <clears throat> debating some existing positions over uh, this format is um, it just, it doesn't always feel right. That's why I've always kind of, uh, you know, if somebody comes back and says, yes, if we were to have to cut X number of dollars, that means we would have to remove positions um, without listing those positions. That to me is, you know, acceptable because then at least we know, right? We know that um, that's what it's going to be to get to a certain percentage. Um, we definitely want to be respectful of um, everyone's lives and livelihood and um, make sure that, that you know, we have respect for that as well. So um, I see that Melissa has her hand up. Yeah, I have a question about those positions on the spreadsheet that currently filled, whether it's the teacher or the ed tech positions, are they funded from the local budget or are they project funds? Like, so there's um, the one line item that has six and four. Like, what is funding those positions? Uh, those are superintendent, you're on mute. Budget. Those are, if, if you wanted us to get down to a certain number, that was so that we could tell you about approximately how many positions would be cut. And that so would be from the local budget. Sorry, I was muted. I was coughing and I muted myself. Sorry. No problem. Um, do we have any other questions from committee members? All right, I'm not seeing any. Um, can I make one request? Um, I don't know, Cheryl, if you have it. Uh, the what's coming in the future slide from your presentation from last time yeah it's the one that talks about the impact in 24 25 based on the funding that was last it's in your original presentation uh, i think it's 37. The heat's on, so my system is always slow when the heat's on. Mm 
maybe, maybe that one. Yes, thank you. So I just want to be mindful as we look forward. So to make sure I understand this right, I know the pre-K looking for a grant that doesn't kick in until 2024, which is the 180, the bridge program you're looking at funding for. Um, we talked about the ESSER last week um, with that 2.8 million, uh, about the 52 positions, but not all of them will be renewed. Um, that's in 2025. So I don't even know if you've gotten as far as um, what you would consider keeping and what not. So, uh, you know, I'm okay if we don't discuss that. But the 2024 ED 279 funding, that 480,000, um, that's from the, the teacher to student ratios. Um, can you explain that one again to me a little bit? Matt, do you want me to do that? Yeah, go ahead. Yep. Um, actually, uh, hold on a second. I can probably go to the slide. That was also in that presentation. Yeah, I was just curious if there were if there were options on that or if that 480 was a definite coming back. Yeah, so for it's we don't know cuz right what they did is this is the slide. Um what they did is they it, they made the student to two, student to teacher ratio go from 17 to 1 to 16 to 1. And when they did that it actually increased our revenue because of that. And so if that was a temporary change, so we don't know if it will continue into next year. We didn't expect them to keep grades one through five from last year. So we were kind of surprised when they also increased uh, or decreased uh, six to eight this past year. Um, so that's where the grade five is the 288,000 and the grade six gives us 192,000 additional revenue from that change. So that 488 is those two yeah. numbers returning to normal. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, 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 and you know, uh, chair, that is, um, as Cheryl mentioned, we were, they, a lot of these are adjustments that they're making as related to COVID impacts to those, to the 279 and to the formulas. And so we're not sure if those are going to continue. And if so, how long we were not prepared for the one for grades one, five to uh, grades one through five to continue, uh, but it did. And so it's the same thing with grades six through eight. And that kind of gets back to when where I was talking about the carryover. We're looking at, hey, if those two things go away in the formula and they change the, imp, the uh, tweak that they made to the formula for economically disadvantaged, which we're being told is not a permanent change. And then you also look at our valuation going up. Those are the concerns that we have that we want to be able to be you know, mindful of in terms of uh, coming down, because if that's those situations were to happen, that's, a, you know, a decrease in the funding that we'd be receiving. And there's no other way to make that up other than the cutting of positions. Right. So when you get down where he just talked about the valuation, yeah. this is what he was talking about with valuation. And next year, the 2022 jumps up drastically, and it's going to have us losing about another $797,000 of revenue. Now, I do yeah, want to say, no rate. <laughs> yeah, and, and I do want to say that we are aware of that as York County superintendents, and we're already, and I've already, uh, same thing with uh, city manager Buck, we've had this conversation that we've got to start some of our efforts now uh, to start pointing that out to people so that we can get some, um, some energy around that and hopefully some relief because that is a major impact that's gonna be happening because of how it works uh, presently in the formula. Right, and then the economically disadvantaged is another big piece. Right, yep. We talked about on this page, um, 651,000 of that is 
uh, formula change they made for one year. That's that's why we we feel we need to leave our fund balance there. If I could go back to the valuation piece for just a moment, we start. I started that conversation, um, as Superintendent Nelson indicated, have started it with the Mayors Coalition as well, because other than Sanford, the, the the eleven communities that are in that coalition all saw their school funding go down this year. Right. Uh, and, it's, and it's next year when that significant change of valuation is going to impact. If the formula is left as it currently is. And there's, you know, greater than a 5% change, we're going to take it on the chin, which we know that there's going to be greater than a 5% change. I have to believe that the original intent in that law looked at the 5% average, you know, year over year when they used the, the past three years, prior three years, was that it assumed that that 5% was due to new valuation, not a change in the valuation dependent upon market pressures, right? They need, they being the state, they need to take a look at that because it's not just Sanford, it's not just Southern Maine, it's all municipalities in the state of Maine that are taking these, these type of impacts. So as long as they hold us all proportional in there, similar to rev sharing and other parts of our formulation, you get your piece of the pie based upon these, these ratios. Uh, I think we can make reasonable grounds in this. State doesn't take it on the chin. We don't take it on the chin. They, they simply need to recognize that the original EPS formulation was based upon a different set of assumptions than what's currently taking place. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. This makes it really difficult um, because things could work out, right, based on the uh, the grants and um, if these, if we can, you know, show people the, uh, that these formulas need to stay in place. Um, but if not, then we could be heading for some really tough decisions in the future. And that's uh, definitely not a position I want to be in uh, or have you in. Um, so that's, that's the only thing that I just don't know if I've figured out yet the best way to, to, um, to look at those years coming in the future. That's the challenge for sure. Yep. All right, um, Councillor Stackpole, I see your hand up. I don't want to go back over too much what I said last week, but I just wanted to point it out. Point out as I was listening to Superintendent Nelson, um, he's put a lot of thought into this, and. Again, uh, last year I talked about we had three years to use this money to help our students. And as long as we went into this uh, with our eyes open, so to speak, which is what uh, the superintendent uh, was discussing even this evening, that it's, it's not to say 100% of these positions, they're going to find a place for them through attrition or otherwise. But uh, the, the impact, uh while somewhat negative possibly somewhat negative i, I think will probably overweigh the positives of having uh, um, th these funds available to help students for the next three years i guess what i'm saying is uh myself as a member of the community i i'm willing to take that risk uh and i think the superintendent is prepared and the school district uh, is prepared as a whole uh to deal with this um, matter um, in usual substance, right, of the fund, which is unlikely. Then you have things play out um, over the course of the three years. The superintendent has a plan. We, I think I called it plan B in the past. And as evidence tonight, he's, he and his administrative team have put a lot of thought into this. Uh, and and uh, I think we need to trust in them that they're going to do the best job that they can. Uh, and I think it will be okay. Thank you. Uh, Melissa, I see your hand up. Yes. And this may be going back to Deputy Mayor's point earlier. She asked about whether the school had looked into the use of contracts. And perhaps I'm like over 
simplifying some of this, but when we look at the ESSA funds and that they will expire in three years, it's not a matter of cutting positions. I'm assuming that people who are hired under ESSA funds are hired with project-based contracts. It's not a matter of cutting positions, it's a matter of contracts expire. Right. And if you have new funds in place, you can decide, or new revenues, new funding, you can decide which of those contracts are renewed, but we are not put into a position in three years to decide what positions get cut because they weren't intended to last longer than the funding. Yeah, good point. I mean, that's probably not a good choice of word as positions will be cut. They're just going to be eliminated. They're not, they're not, they weren't intended to be anything other than a short term in terms of that. Like I said prior to that, there some of these positions are addressing needs for us that also existed probably before COVID, that the COVID situation just came back to make it, um, you know, to uh, uh, make it even more important. But the, the understanding has been all along, and that was the decision that we made when to invest in positions that, especially those who have other experience with grants, you know that that sometimes happens, right? They go away and the expectation is that you're gonna come back and fund that on a local side. And we've been pretty clear here, knowing that that is not something that is gonna be uh, possible when you start talking about that, but that was something we were okay with because we wanted to get our kids back in school five days a week and be able to help in the short term with any educational recovery and learning loss uh, that had happened. Um, for it. So yeah, I, bad choice of words when I say they're going to have their positions cut, because that's, that, that kind of implies something a little bit different that we weren't, that we were intending to keep those positions. And that's not the case when we've been able to use these federal funds uh, through the ESSER. All right. And then um, the last thing I'll say is, even from my standpoint, um, the ESSER funds aren't my biggest concern um, just because of that piece. If you, for simple math's sake, took the 2.8 million and you removed the expense of the 2.8 million when those funds expire, it's the, um, the revenue program change and the, um, the student teacher ratio funding change um, that, in, please somebody correct my math if I'm wrong, you know, could provide a million dollar swing um, with no, uh, with nothing to cut from that piece, right? That's just a funding change on one side or that you're losing. And uh, again, if I'm inflating that number, uh, please correct me, but those are, that's the item that sticks out to me the most. If we can find grants to cover the Pre-K, you know, that's great. If we can find additional funding for the bridge program, that's great. But it's those other dollars that um, I look at and say, I don't know if we have a, or, or I don't have a solution for that. Um, you know, I'm assuming that that's something you're planning for. That's, that's bit, that is at the heart of our, uh, of our decision or our recommendation exactly. Is that something that at the end of the day, we, we're trying to do our best to maintain and sustain. And that's a big concern that I have going forward. Based on the information that we have, um, I think that would be the prudent thing for us, uh, for us to be able to go forward with. All right, so um, Cheryl, if you don't mind, could you put up the spreadsheet again? with the yes, no. Hold on, I'm gonna try put it on my other screen and see if it, for some reason it's not letting me. Well. That was weird, okay, hold on. And then while, while she's doing that, um, I'll ask the committee members if there are any more comments, um, recommendations that anyone wants to bring up while she's pulling that spreadsheet. Uh, 
Okay, I'm not seeing any. Um, with that said, we'll just do the similar exercise that we did on the city side. Um, so we will start with the pre-K expansion and um, I will ask if there is anyone who wants to see the pre-K expansion uh, as, a, as a, so I'm gonna base my questions on how it's in the current budget now. So just so everybody understands that. So the way I phrase it is based on what, how it's listed in the budget spreadsheet right now. So for the pre-K expansion, if is there anyone who wants to advocate for removing the pre-K expansion expenses? Okay, I'm not seeing any. So um, let's move to the bridge expansion. Is there anyone who wants to advocate for removing the bridge expansion dollars? Okay, not seeing any there. Um, so let's go to the other services and um, maybe this, I don't know how much discussion this will be um, if we need to take it line by line. So what I would prefer to do in the interest of time is just ask um, if anyone wants to see any of these services removed from the budget. Right now they're all in the budget. If you wanna see any of these dollars removed from the budget, um, please speak up now and we can talk through um, which line items. All right, I'm not seeing any. Um, yeah, I think from my standpoint on those, the other with the, the 42,000, um, well, I guess we have the ed techs in here as well. So the original other from the slide was the $42,000. That, that seems like a, a small amount. Um, if we talk just about the ed tech um, support and transition positions, is there anyone who wants to see those positions removed from the budget? Okay, seeing none. Um, so I think that's everything. Correct, Cheryl? Yep. <clears throat> All right. So, um, where we stand right now is, um, uh, basically where we ended last week after the adjustments on both the school and the city side budget. So right now we're looking at, uh, on the city side, the, um, and I don't have the dollars in front of me, but I know it's the negative zero point zero six percent over last year. And on the school side, um, having those dollars in front, it's an additional seven hundred twenty-seven thousand um, and twenty-six dollars to net taxation, uh, which is an increase of four point nine percent. I wanted to just see if anybody wanted to have any further discussion um, over these numbers. Um, and if not, then we will um, move forward to our new business and, and start uh, Chair, making our Chair, motions. Chair, I think, is Cheryl, is that right? The 4.9? I think if you add the 42,000 into that, it comes less, right? Yeah, did they well, vote to take that? I don't think they did yet. Yeah, right now, um, nobody came forward asking for that 42,000 to be removed. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, you're fine. All right, so um, so we'll go on to new business. Um, so what I'd like to do first um, is start with the two bonds. So um, so Ronnie, I'm gonna lean on you to um, correct me if I, uh, don't use the, uh, if I don't follow the rules properly or if there's something else I need to do. Um, as we make these motions, please correct me. Um, do I need to read the entire thing, Ronnie, or since it's presented, can I just make the motion asking um, if we want to uh, accept this as it's worded on the screen? 
I believe, Steve, don't they have to take a vote to waive the reading? You could waive the reading, uh, and, and then we have the, the information before you. This is the sample language that our bond council would, would develop. Uh, Ronnie brought this, this forward in this format, so you could take that under, consider under consideration. Again, this is going to debt service. It's a $1 million bond for the uh, required match and or leverage funding for the $5 million EPA Brownsfield cleanup grant. You need to support redevelopment activities in the Milliad, primarily the sites at the International Woolen Mill property, including demolition of the boiler house stack, uh, stack and construction of the new surface, parking to meet the needs of the mill yard and other costs related thereto. Bottom language allows for uh, amendments to that. So it caps the amount at a million dollars that would be done through the main bond bank. Uh, the impact in this year's debt service is $9,300, $9,370. Uh, and then there'd be a 10 year bond payment on average of, a, of approximately $108,000. Uh, that being said, the flexibility that the bond council puts in here is if they do a lesser scope or redirect, they be in the council, or, or redirect the use of the bonds, or if should the brownfield match come in less than that, it allows the council to de-stroke uh, the, the project and, and re-scope as necessary. So the budget committee pursuant to the city charter uh, needs to review uh, all bonding that's proposed, even if it's the $250,000 limit that the, the city council has, the budget committee is to review those. As we've had in the past, uh, many times there's, there's bonding that comes up mid-year or something like that. We'll call a joint meeting of the budget committee and the city council for that consideration. But where these two pieces are known as of today in the current budget development, that's why we asked for the review and to get a, a, a vote of support or non-support as far as uh, the proposal of the bond itself. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, Councillor Stackpole. I don't really have any questions, but I, I do want to say that I think as a community, uh, we need to be as aggressive as we can possibly be uh, in cleaning up these brownfields uh, properties, um, particularly the mill yard properties. Um, uh, I think the, the uh, societal effect the, of the um, deplorable conditions in some areas down there really have a detrimental uh, effect on, uh, on our downtown area and uh, give a black eye to our community. Uh, and uh, we really need to support these, uh, these bonds. So. All right, thank you very much. Any other questions? All right, so then um, at this point in time, I'd like to make a motion to approve um, question one as listed uh, to move forward to the city council for their approval. I'll second. second. We have a second. Is there any discussion? All right, and seeing none, we'll go to a vote. Uh, Deputy Mayor Hurley. Uh, yes. Councillor Brink. Yes. Councillor Stackpole. Yes. Lindsey Quinn. Yes. Melissa Alapalo. Yes. Amy Garno. Sorry, Sorry yes, yes. And uh, I am a yes as well. So it's unanimous uh, to pass for question one. So now if we move to question two, um, and thanks Steve, I can just read through this one uh, and then start the process if that works or unless there's anything you wanna say about this. Again, this $250,000, it's, it's within the scope of the city council. They have bonding authority up to $250,000. Uh, but as the last, the first phase, the council did that in conjunction with the review by the budget committee. Uh, and then we put that out for uh, bonding with, with uh, main bond bank. Uh, the reason for the bond is the, uh, between the, 
development fee that's being paid, as well as the uh, use of tax increment financing yeah. in the omnibus district, this cash flows. But you need to, in order to meet the cash flow uh, capacity of the, the second phase, you need to do a five-year bond in order to match up the cash flow. Otherwise, you, you, you would be absent that cash flow cap capacity. All right, and uh, I'll ask if there's any questions um, around question two. All right, so then um, at this time, I'll make a motion um, to move question two forward to this uh, city council for their approval. Second. All right, we have a second. Is there any discussion around this? Seeing none, we'll go to the vote. Uh, Deputy Mayor Hurley? Yes. Councillor Brink? Yes. Councillor Stackpole? Yes. Lindsay Quinn? Yes. Melissa Alapalo? Yes. Amy Garno? Yes. And I'm a yes as well, so that passes unanimously as well. All right, so now um, we will move on to the municipal budget. Um, and if you don't mind, um, could we get those numbers back up on the screen? Stevie, are you letting me bring that up or are you going to bring it up? I have it up right now. So this is the the spreadsheet, this is as you've made amendments by consensus so far, yeah. but it, budget committee's recommendations, these would be the. <laughs> okay, so, um, so this is just the city side, perfect. So are there any other questions, comments before we look for a motion on the um, municipal budget? All right, so seeing none. Um, so basically what we've got is, um, so Ronnie, as we make this motion, what are the key pieces to reading this through? And I apologize, but this is the first year um, as chair. So I just wanna make sure we do this appropriately. Do we list out the municipal appropriation, the capital reserve, and then the um, undesignated funds and then the total, or do we just need the totals? So if you could do each individually appropriation, capital reserve, revenue, and undesignated, and then a final uh, net to be raised by taxation. And you can do that in one vote, as long as it's just written in the minutes. Please. But we, it's just the totals we have to go over, right? That's correct. Okay. And Lindsay, did you catch that to make sure it's in the minutes? Hold on, please repeat. I was taking notes on something else at the moment. Go ahead. So as we make the motion for the budget, um, we're gonna go through each of the sections, yeah. the totals. Um, so if you could capture each of those totals um, in the motion, that would be perfect. All right, so um, I will make the motion to approve the uh, municipal budget with a total municipal appropriation of $31,597,155. Uh, capital reserve of four million two hundred sixty-four thousand two hundred twenty-four dollars. Um, the use of undesignated funds to be eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Oh, excuse me, I missed uh, the total mun municipal revenue to be sixteen million six hundred ninety-six thousand one hundred forty-two dollars. Uh, the use of designated funds to be eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars for a net to be raised by taxation of $18,315,237, uh, which is uh, down $11,745 from last year's budget and a, a decrease of 0.06%. Do we have a second? Second. Any discussion? 
All right, seeing none, we'll put this to the vote. Deputy Mayor Hurley. Yeah. Councillor Brink. Yes. Councillor Stackpole. Yes. Lindsey Quinn. Yes. Melissa Alapalo. Yes. Amy Garno. Yes. And myself will be a yes as well. So that will pass unanimously. Uh, six to one. No, six to one. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought it was a yes. Um, no, it was a no for me. Okay. So I misunderstood. Thank you, Maura. Yeah. So that passes six to one. Now, if we could get the school numbers up as well, that would be appreciated. Ronnie, are you putting that up on yes. how you can show it? Okay. Yep. So, Wes, the school numbers um, are right here, the 58,894,561 in the yellow. So on this oh, sheet, okay. vote total appropriations um, for the school and then their CIP, and then I'll bring you over to the revenue section. Okay. Uh, oh, the capital improvements right below it, right? Okay. So then it's just the two, line 30 and line 35, correct? Um, line 34. Oh, 34. Okay. Yep. All right. So um, I'll make the motion to approve <coughs> the um, school budget as presented with the total school appropriation to be $58,894,561 with the capital reserve of $363,995. And then on the revenue side, it'll be line 21. With a revenue of $43,780,711. And then the amount to be raised by taxation would be uh, right here, the $15,477,845. All right, thank you. So with the net to be raised by taxes of $15,477,845, uh, which is an increase of $727,027 from the previous year uh, for a percent increase of 4.93%. Do we have a second? Second. Any discussion? All right, seeing none, um, we will go to vote. Uh, Deputy Mayor Hurley? No. Councillor Brink? Yes. Councillor Stackpole? Yes. Lindsey Quinn? Yes. Melissa Alapalo? Yes. Amy Garno? Yes. And I will vote yes on that as well. So that passes uh, six to one. All right, so I believe that concludes everything, Ronnie, or is there anything we've missed? No, that concludes everything. Okay. So then um, as far as an agenda for the next meeting, um, it looks like we won't need next week's meeting. Um, so the presentation to the city council, if I have the right schedule, is supposed to be on April 5th, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. All right. So then, um, in order for that presentation, um, who would I work with on that um, as we prepare for that? You can work with me, Wes. Okay. And I know, um, Councillor Stackpole, you've presented it last year. Um, so I may reach out to you. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, anytime. Yeah, and I think you have my number. Didn't I uh, email that to you? 
Yeah. I do. Yep. 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 All right. So then we can move on. Um, budget committee comments. Um, let's start with you, um, Deputy Mayor Hurley. I'm all set this evening. Thank you. Councillor Brink. I'd just like to thank everybody who volunteered to work on this committee. Uh, it was great working with you. It was lo lovely seeing some faces that I haven't seen since you were quite a bit younger. Um, and <laughs> thank all the administrators for their presentation. It was just wonderful. And Bob, we are the older ones um, in this group, so we can live with it. Okay. Yeah, we can live with it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, I think I'm next anyways, aren't I, Wes? Correct. Yeah. So, yeah, also, uh, uh, as, a, as a member of the council and as a citizen, uh, uh, thank uh, the uh, voluntary uh, members of the, of the budget committee. Um, it, it's not an easy job, uh, as you, you found out. It's not the most difficult job in the world either, but, uh, and I think it's quite interesting um, this is part of, as they say in politics, this is part of the sausage being made. Uh, so uh, um, I want to thank everybody. Uh, uh, thank Superintendent Nelson, uh, everyone on the school side, the administrative team, uh, business manager for the hours and hours and hours of work that, uh, that you've put into this. And the same goes to city manager Buck uh, and his team uh, for the fine work that they do uh, on the municipal side. We had a thorough discussion, I believe, tonight on both sides of the budget. Um, we, we pushed the administrators to see where we could go. And I think we found where we could go and as a budget committee where we wanted to go. Uh, there were things that we didn't want to touch and we didn't touch them. Uh, so I think we've got a good package here that we can move on to the council. That doesn't mean that the council isn't going to tweak things a little bit this way, a little bit that way. That's their prerogative. Uh, but I think that the uh, budget committee did an excellent job. Uh, and there's, there's, uh, we have a good budget package moving up to the city council. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, Lindsay. Um, I just, I, I was so impressed with tonight's spreadsheets, the ability to turn things off on and off and see the effects of everything. That was super, super helpful for me. I, love Excel. I'm such a nerd for spreadsheets. So I was really tickled by that. Um, from both departments, it was nice to have that, that option. Uh, you guys work really, really hard and I don't envy the hours put into these positions because this is not um, an easy task and we give you a lot of work and you have to turn around in a week's time. So I've been thinking about you all this week. Um, I, I appreciate everyone's work. Uh, this is a new process for me. I will probably be reaching out to Ronnie regarding make sure I got all those numbers correct in that last vote from the cells. Maybe you can send me um, those last two screens because I wrote down the cells that I needed to pull the information from. So if you could send that for me, that would be great. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, Melissa. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, the process and just um, learning by serving and I, I really did learn so much about our communities and our schools and all the work that goes into me just um, putting the budget together. I appreciate your patience and answering our questions and um, it was real uh, pleasure to serve and I look forward to hearing what the council has to say about the budget. All right, thank you. Amy. Um, so I just wanted to thank, um, you know, city manager Buck and Cheryl and Ronnie and superintendent uh, Matt Nelson. I think a lot of it's it's hard times, COVID's been really rough. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully, um, you know, it gets to the city council and we can um, see what, you know, if they make any cuts to get it a little less than a, you know, 2% is still kind of high for some folks. So, so I guess we'll see how that goes. All right, thank you. Um, and then I just want to echo 
uh, what most others have said, um, thank you to the city manager and um, his team, as well as the superintendent and his team, um, school committee. Um, I want to thank the new members of the budget committee this year um, for jumping in and being um, helpful and bringing new voices to the process um, and uh, taking the secretary position off of um, deputy mayor's hands for the first time and I don't know how long so uh, that's very much appreciated so uh, uh, yes thank you, I, I definitely appreciate that thank you <laughs> I'm trying I'm trying uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll be um, curious to, to see how the uh, conversation continues with the City Council. Um, again, it's late, so I'm going to wrap up. Um, thank you very much. So we'll move on to the next uh, item to adjourn, and uh, we will adjourn the meeting at 919. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone.